There are three things I want to say. Oh, dear Lord. Wasn't that brilliant? I'm still just stunned by today. I've been doing this for 22 Wasn't years that, at yeah, that was one of the single best moments in 22 years. Just Maria today, I'm lighting it up on, on football. And, uh, seriously, it, what, what you, the way you are, John, what I witnessed with the tots, thank you, Mr. Levy, for letting me see a hat trick by son, the Korean, but the way Maria is, is foreign to Americans, and it was just <laughs> wonderful to what? see that. Does Mr. Levy know that you call it the tots, and is he happy about it? <laughs> well, I've got mixed reports on that. <laughs> Although I have him in my bracket for the finals. That's good to France, know. Argentina, and, and the tots. Spain, and the tots. So who does Harry play for if it's tots England? <laughs> it's up to him. <laughs> Equities right now look like this. This is ridiculous. We're down a quarter of 1% <laughs> on the S&P. Four days of losses on the equity market. Will we make it five? On the Nasdaq, we're down about four-tenths of 1%. Yields yesterday's twos, tens... Negative 80-something basis points. We go deeper and deeper and deeper. The deepest inversion we've seen since, no. I think, 1981. Right. October 1981. Right now, yields on a 10-year unchanged at 353.31. Yields come back in a little bit by a couple of basis points, Tom. 434.74 on a US two-year. Ian Lingen at BMO again talking about a possibility to a negative 100 basis points. It hasn't been seen since, I think, biblical times. And... We'll have to see on that within the recession screen. We come to you today with a lot of humility. John Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and I know that oil is the toughest commodity to call. There's all sorts of academic research that shows that. Yesterday we had on Edward Morris of Citigroup with a huge political economic standpoint on hydrocarbons. And today, as acute, Francisco Blanche joins us, head of global commodities and derivatives research at Bank of America. Francisco, you were the first one out that I knew to model $100 a barrel. You made global headlines with it. You were right. Up we went, and then down we can, came on, I'm going to say, a dearth of demand. Christopher Rohn was just on, the technical analyst, and says the spot market for oil is behaving differently than the futures market for oil. Explain in Greek what that means. Well, uh, you want me to use... Uh uh, Vegas and uh, and uh, deltas in, in in the process, Tom. Maybe not, right? L let me just say it in plain English. Uh, we have um, uh, essentially a very low uh, speculative interest. Uh, essentially, all the all the uh, uh, macro players have been selling oil on the back of. Uh, on the back of recession fears, uh, some of the comments that you were just making uh, before uh, we went on the oil segment. Uh, also, we've seen a, a dearth of liquidity. Liquidity is falling very quickly in the forward markets, and um, and then I think I think beyond that, uh, the the physical market's been actually relatively uh, uh, more supported, although that's changing a bit too, because uh, it, it turns out that the Russian supply disruption we were all expecting on the back of the EU sanctions hasn't really um, right. come through as expected, and 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 maybe we won't be losing as much Russian oil after all. Long ago and far away, uh, Lisa Abramowitz put two kids through school speculating on oil when it went down under zero. There was that huge shock of 18 months ago, two years ago. And we kid her that she had two barrels of oil in her living room on delivery. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get the same spring here? Did we have a possibility of seeing 70 West Texas Intermediate become 95 or 100 West Texas Intermediate in a cup of coffee? Um, I, I'm afraid so. I think we have a very springy, I think you use a great word there, uh, springy uh, oil market um, because uh, inventories remain quite low, uh, spare capacity is tight. And if, if you look at, at the three key drivers of oil prices heading into 2023, they're clearly, uh, in my view, uh, whatever happens to OPEC plus Russia, uh, whatever happens to uh, China reopening, and the third one being the Fed pivot. Um, and, and the way I think about each one of those is uh, if you look at our 2023 numbers, all the demand growth that we forecast for next year is coming from emerging markets with China being 50% of that and India being about 20%. So uh, we need emerging markets to come back strong. And uh, it's still a little early, it's still a little unclear uh, how China is going to make a comeback. Um, and, and it may be a different comeback than the one that we saw in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, particularly if, if the reopening is one of fits and starts, uh, partly because I think the Chinese population is, is, has not really been much exposed to COVID. We, we talk about the post-COVID world in, in, in Europe and the U.S., but really China hasn't had 
COVID uh, broadly disseminated yet to the extent that we've seen it uh, in in most other countries in the world. And so that's number one. Number two is really uh, Russia OPEC. Uh, how does that play out? How much oil do we lose from Russia? And how much oil does OPEC plus actually take out of the market? And then the third one really being the OPEC, uh, the uh, Fed tightening uh, uh, policy uh, and which at the moment we have OECD economies essentially growing zero next year. But of course, if the Fed, uh, Fed, if uh, US uh, Fed fund rates go to 6%, 7%, that could become negative pretty quickly here. And that's another big uncertainty. And part of the reason oil prices have been falling uh, in recent days. So how much do you think that they could rise? I know that you have a target of perhaps $100 for WTI and $94 for Brent. How do we get there, given all of what you talk about, given that we already right. are seeing some fits and starts with respect to a Chinese a reopening and it hasn't really caused the price to go up that much um well so so um again i think i think the the macro picture is uh, is pretty gloomy here um and and that's part of the reason prices have come down but uh but i think it's a bit of a different environment to to prior uh pullbacks in oil prices uh first uh we think there is a, there's a put uh that will be triggered i mean opec just had their meeting um on sunday decided to roll over the cuts um but uh Remember, the cuts, announced cuts were 2 million barrels a day. Nobody expected OPEC to implement a 2 million barrel a day cut. Uh, they could actually go and do that. They could actually implement a deeper cut. Um, and also, we're going to see WTI uh, um, prices uh, entering the range at which the U.S. government uh, will start filling or refilling, rather, the strategic uh, petroleum reserve. Uh, I remember that number that was put out by the White House was uh, $72 a barrel on WTI. Yeah. So we're getting close to the point where, where we might see uh, those triggers providing support to prices here. So it's a bit of a different to the uh, environment to the to the 2020 world where, where prices just cratered Francisco, on the back of a collapse in demand. Can you elaborate on that? Because this has been one of the big question marks. If the U.S. has said $72 a barrel was the time they'd start buying, and one of the big drivers of the decline in oil prices has been the, uh, the release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, how much is that going to cause prices to rise? Are we almost there yet where this administration ought to start buying based on what they've said and that will actually drive prices much higher perhaps in the short term? Well, um, again, uh, I'm just going by why the White House uh, communique was uh, a couple months ago. They, they are um, they're saying they're going to be buying oil as, as soon as we get below the 72 hour threshold. And the balance could change uh, pretty dramatically here. We could see an extra uh, half a million barrels a day of demand uh, from uh, from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, remember that you need to probably put in 150 to 200 million barrels back in store. That's, uh, uh, again, that, that, that takes a whole year of buying half a million barrels a day. Uh, right, I mean that's simple math there, right? So, um, so you could see a pretty meaningful swing in, in balances in that regard. Uh, you could also see uh, heading into 2023, uh, China reopening, picking up momentum. Um, even even if the first two, three, four months could be a little uh, patchy, and and then of course uh, I think the sanctions on on Russian petroleum products, which kick in on February five, are certainly a much bigger deal than the sanctions on. Uh, Russian crude, which have turned out to be uh, a, a lot to do about nothing, really. What do you make? Uh, you mentioned the Xi Jinping meeting in Saudi Arabia. Well, how does that affect the dynamic of the oil picture, just given the sense that there seems to be an ongoing and public display of increased closeness there? Well, I, I think that's uh, only a, a natural development of, of uh uh, the bilateral trade relationship between Saudi Arabia and China, which has changed dramatically since uh, the advent of U.S. shale. Remember, the U.S. is now a net exporter of energy. Uh, we've argued the U.S. was going to be energy independent for the last 10 years, but now we're arguing the U.S. is going to be energy dominant. So in some ways, the U.S. Uh, is a competitor to Saudi Arabia in the energy space. Um, and I think um, I think uh, in, in that regard, uh, the the uh, trade with uh, between Riyadh and Beijing has really picked up uh, pretty yeah. dramatically. So so that 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 I think is just the natural change of, of commercial uh, relationships. Maria from Brussels emails in and what says, "Can Francisco make the kick from 12 yards out? He's hey, in he Madrid. He probably His, could. He probably had a tough day he, yesterday. He probably could. That was just brutal yesterday. Yeah, that was some of the worst penalties. Francisco's in Madrid, and you know, he's I'm sure. The, the, the city must be gloomy. Francisco, do you want to weigh in on that? 
Yeah, it's not. It wasn't a happy. Uh, it wasn't a happy day yesterday. I have to say. Um, you know, the 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 team just kept passing the ball without really uh, the Spanish team without really scoring. So uh, it was a little disappointing. Um, and yeah, mood's a little gloomy here. You can see the background. Uh, the sun hasn't come out yet. Uh, <laughs> may not come out for a couple more days. Does Moynihan know you're in Madrid? I mean, he's talking about expense control, Francisco. How did this hey, happen? You're causing trouble now. I'm causing I trouble. I mean. This is great. It's like Pharaoh and Cutter. You just, know. just run, Francisco. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to try. <laughs> uh, I think. I, look, I mean, we, we have an office here. We have about. There we uh, go. We have, we, we have an office. It, 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 it was an empty office when I got here, uh, the one I got. So I, I don't think it's. Uh, I'm, I'm actually yeah. beefing up expenses here. Right, right, right. There the we go. Thing. Thank you, Francisco. Wonderful, sir. Thank you very much, Francisco Blanche. There, of Bank of America. These guys in crude, I think, have the hardest job. Hardest job. Understood. Absolutely. No I question. And we often about say it. if you want to make a fool out of someone, ask them to predict the crude right. price year rent because this one has been and, tough, tough, tough. And, and the academics and the differential between an Ed Morris with huge Princeton politics and Francisco with a wonderful European sense to it, and Jeff Curry, the microeconomist from Chicago, you get. You know, you get a really different tone from each of them. And there's others as well. Um, Amrita Sen, I just, I worship. Energy she's aspects. She's great. She's great she's too. Great. Do you want a range for next year on a 10-year treasury yield? I'm going to bring you two calls. <laughs> Steve Major of HSBC <clears throat> just published. Okay. Pub from where? Cutter? No, I don't actually know. I'll try and find out. Maybe he is Probably watching Hong the football. Kong. 250 for year end 23 on a 10-year. 250. That's Steve's call for next wow. year. Okay. Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo yesterday. You had him on yesterday. 475, 425 to 475, year end 23 on a 10 year. And Eric says one of our highest conviction views heading into 23 is that a US 10 year yield of 350 is simply too low. That's the range right now. So you've got HSBC saying 250 year end 23, and you've got Wells Fargo saying potentially 475. At least it got into next year. I mean, can that get any wider? We don't understand inflation. Nobody understands the path of inflation. Nobody understands the path of growth. And the, the gap here really highlights just how much uncertainty there is right now. A crazy time. Crazy, crazy. That's Equity futures right absolutely now. Absolutely original. Down two tenths. Your yield on a 10-year, 353.49 from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock has turned back Republican Herschel Walker in Georgia's runoff election. Warnock was re-elected with a little more than 51 percent of the vote. His victory will give Democrats a 51 to 49 edge in the Senate, making it easier to legislate. Walker had been backed by former President Trump. China is retreating from the wide-ranging COVID-0 policy that it blamed for damaging the economy. Beijing will now allow some people to quarantine at home instead of in centralized camps. It's also scrapping virus tests to enter public venues. COVID-0 pushed down consumer and business confidence and left people stuck in, in a cycle of outbreaks and lockdowns. Saudi Arabia rolling out the red carpet for Xi Jinping today. The Chinese leader will visit the kingdom for several days and will take part in a regional summit with Arab leaders. According to the Saudi news agency, Xi is promising agreements worth some $30 billion. The trip comes two months after the Saudis snubbed President Biden's pleas for oil. Shares of GSK and Sanofi are surging today. A U.S. judge rejected scientific evidence behind claims that the heartburn drug Zantac can cause cancer. That means the drug makers don't have to face more than 5,000 lawsuits. A group of plaintiffs' lawyers say they'll appeal. And Apple may be cruising along with its CarPlay technology, but the tech giant tapping the brakes on plans for its self-driving car. Sources tell Bloomberg the company has postponed the future electric vehicle's launch date by about, the year, by about a year to 2026. Apple is planning a new design that will include a steering wheel and pedals and only support full autonomous capabilities on highways. The price tag, just under $100,000. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Thousands and thousands of firms kept telling us month after month after month, and they're still telling us that until COVID zero is truly over, and not announced is over, but it's truly past us. The firms do not want to invest. They don't want to borrow. 
and they don't want to hire. And so just by announcing COVID zero is over, we, we, you know, pulling back some of them easing measures, this is all great. It makes the lives of citizens happier. That was Lena Miller, the China Beige Book International CEO, live from New York City. Equity shaping up as follows on the S&P. We're down about four tenths of one percent. Four days of losses into Wednesday. Will we make it day five? Euro dollar just about positive. One of four ninety five. Tom yields unchanged at three fifty three eighty six on a ten year crude. Yeah. Keep coming back to crude. We've got China incrementally reopening, easing restrictions. I think is the best way of putting it. And we've got crude rolling over the last couple of days, Tom. 74 handle and basically negative for yeah, 22. I'll agree with that. The, the, the China's part of the story here. But the, I'd also note that Yuan has come in and now has found some stability near 7 Yuan, 6.98 Yuan per dollar. And, and, and I don't think we can look at the financial aspects of China right now. They are so overtaken by this pandemic, this virus, that the normal analysis we do just doesn't work. I think Leland would also suggest, Tom, there's other things going on beyond COVID zero. Yeah, thank you. Big property issues as well. The data's not <clears throat> being great. If you just remove COVID zero, yes, you get the short-term burst, then maybe you get right. this cyclical story, positive cyclical story kick back in. But certainly there's some, still some challenges there, TK. Some big challenges at that. Yeah, our, our, our conceit here is we have a knowledge of Hong Kong and Shanghai and Beijing is distant. That is not the case for Thomas McKenzie. He is in London, and Tom McKenzie uh, joins us this morning with many years on the Beijing watch. I was thunderstruck, Tom McKenzie, the first time I got off the airplane in Beijing. It's not the same. It doesn't smell the same. The air is different. The people are different. It's foreign. What is the gap now between what we perceive of China and COVID and the distance to the capital, Beijing? Well, Tom, I think with today's announcement, that gap has narrowed to a degree. John was talking about the incremental changes, and that's absolutely right. But the announcement today from the Politburo really is that pivot on COVID zero. We've heard the rumours, we've heard the speculation, and indeed we have seen those incremental easing measures in the last few days and weeks. And some of those have been walked back again as officials have panicked about outbreaks in their jurisdictions. That changes from today, I think. But to your point... The consequential parts going forward are to what extent this is implemented on the ground, because this is going to be challenging. This is a population that doesn't have right. high levels of immunity. The healthcare system is challenged. So how they actually exit from COVID zero is what we should be watching in the weeks and months ahead. The model, maybe not from 1947, but certainly from Deng, is that the mayors of these big cities have power. Discuss the power nexus now between the cities and their mayors. The city-state of Shanghai is one example. And for that matter, the rural power is well with Beijing. Is there a dialogue or is it imbalanced? More of that power, of course, is concentrated in Xi Jinping's hands. And we just saw that with the latest party congress. One of the reasons why officials now are talking about setting themselves a 5% GDP target for next year, which many would say is ambitious, is precisely to incentivize those local officials to move away from COVID zero and accelerate growth, to put an emphasis on growth, because there is a concern amongst those officials of pushback, reprimands, losing their jobs, sometimes worse, if they don't follow the line of Beijing. That's the reluctance to move away from COVID zero, because they haven't had that clarity until now. So setting themselves that 5% GDP target for 2023, if that does come to pass, the argument would be amongst those officials pushing for that is you incentivize those officials in the villages, in the towns, in the districts to move away from COVID zero and focus on growth. In order for people to really understand how serious China is about moving away from zero COVID, you have to understand the vaccination process, how far mm -hmm. they've gotten in expediting some of the shots in arms, particularly in the older population. How much has that effort gotten underway and created something of a buffer heading into winter? This is a really, really crucial point. I know we discussed it before, but again today, a new line out on the need to accelerate vaccination. So for the context, the over 80s in China, of course, the most vulnerable population, just 50 percent have had their booster shots. Around 60 to 65 percent have had double vaccinations. That pales into comparison to the likes of Japan, the U.S., European nations. So there is a massive catch up that needs to be happening around vaccinating that older, more vulnerable population. And question marks as to why they haven't mandated it. Those questions will continue. They 
they've had three years to do this. They haven't acted quickly enough, would be the argument for many. And certainly failing to approve the vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna has also set them back as well. So we'll see how consequential this vaccine push is in terms of getting more shots in arms and also the building out of fever clinics around the healthcare system to ensure that they're ready for an uptick in infections and hospitalizations that many now predict. Feeding some of the uh, belief that China really is beginning to more fully open up, is Xi Jinping getting out there and meeting with foreign leaders now in Saudi Arabia? Is there some signal to take from there that China is trying to secure enough crude at a decent price, trying to supply itself ahead of a reopening, or is this just basically a reordering of world orders and really a convenience on both sides to show a power of uh, their, their united strength against the U.S.? You know, it was interesting. I was speaking to a trader here in London about a week ago. He said, watch for this meeting between President Xi and the Saudis. There may be an agreement around using the yuan instead of the dollar uh, as part of these transactions on oil. It doesn't look like we're getting there, but that is the interest of some on trading desks here in London around this meeting. It is a push by Xi Jinping to have a more multipolar world, to push back on what they see as Western US-led hegemony. And to some extent, there is a success here from Beijing solidifying this relationship with the Saudis at a time, of course, when we know that Riyadh and Washington have deep frictions that continue, uh, of course, uh, with the Biden administration. So there's a play here. It's complicated. China is a major, of course, user of commodities. It is far from being uh, self-sufficient when it comes to energy. It needs those resources uh, from, Saudi, from the Saudis, uh, but it's deeper than just a transaction around oil. Tom, you've got a Beijing view versus Endicur and based in Hong Kong as well. I'm curious of your view of the potential of what Western banks will do in 2023. Hmm. Are they going to stay as a generalization in Hong Kong with outposts in Beijing and Shanghai, or do you subscribe to the movement to Singapore? Uh, that's a fascinating question and absolutely a theme and a trend we have to watch. I mean, when I was there a little over a year ago, we were still at a place where you spoke to the investment banks of Wall Street, of the UK and Europe, and they said they were pushing to have greater ownership of their operations. There was a fight for talent. They were trying to add headcount, trying to build their footprint in mainland China. That, of course, has been reversed to some extent, and you've seen that with the big names on Wall Street, European lenders as well. The shift to Hong Kong, yes, you speak to the standard charters and HSBCs, they say we are still investing for the long term. We're going to be remain committed to Hong Kong to get that exposure to a reopened Chinese market. Does the shift away from Singapore end next year? I would say that was doubtful, but it's a theme to watch. Hey, Tom, thank you. Great work as always, sir. <coughs> Tom McKenzie out of London. Do we need to drop COVID zero? Just that phrase now. I think we do. It's not just COVID zero or we're open, wide open, and there's no restrictions. This is about China changing its tolerance around this virus. So now I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the restrictions that still exist. So close contacts can quarantine at home now for five days. Well, there's another way of phrasing that. Close contacts still need to quarantine at home for five days. I would go further. Lockdowns in high-risk areas will be lifted if there are no new cases for five consecutive days. Well, there will still be lockdowns in high-risk areas. That's the issue at play for me here, Lisa. I think it's easy to say, yes, no more COVID zero, but that doesn't mean we're wide open in China. We've just shifted the tolerance around this virus. If that policy were implemented in the United States, in New York, that would be considered a lockdown. <clears throat> Without a doubt. That would be considered a very controversial uh, aspect that would close schools, that would end up disrupting workplaces, that would make it very difficult to live a normal life. To your point, that's not a full reopening, but is it the beginning of something that looks more like that, that could potentially be expedited. We're not seeing it in the market. We're not seeing that face. Well, that's how markets think about these things, Tom. It's about the change and ultimately the end game. So you kind of flick yeah. through the pages yeah, and get yeah. to the end chapter and you're not interested in the stuff in between. But no, no. Got did, to you, did you never. ever do that? I always read the no, last page to the conclusion. First. You think I read a book? Anyway. <laughs> I had a cat in college called Cliff Notes. <laughs> I can't, I can't I remember the last the fictional page. story I read. And it, really? Uh, I, I love them, but I always read decades. the back page first, even then, and then I read the in middle stuff. But I, I get it's can't, very it's very stressful to not know. do fiction. Can anyway, I, can I just very quickly here, I, I do want to mention it is the 81st anniversary of something which framed my childhood, which is Pearl Harbor. And what's different this year, and it started in March, is I've been there, John. I've smelled the oil above the Arizona. The oil, quarts a day, still leaking out 81 years on from the Arizona. And finally, from an environmental standpoint, they're saying of this small harbor, harbor what are we going to do? It's like ESG 
creeping in on Pearl Harbor. This you is under it's debate. Been, it's been going on for that long. 81 years, the oil still leaks out. You, you're in this very emotional monument above the boat, the ship. I didn't know that. Time. And the oil comes up. You're standing there smelling it. That's and insane. Finally, for the entire harbor, the Navy's under some Pentagon push to clean it up. How many years? 81? 81 years. Wow. Coming up next on this market, Alessio DeLongis of Invesco. Looking forward to that. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is too high, and I will contend that this current inflation battle is not one off. The likelihood of a soft landing is quite low. The idea that we're going to have a soft landing means that so much of the data would be historically unique. No one is placing big bets yet that we'll see this miraculous second half rally, but certainly that's the sentiment. The only thing that we can be sure about is that this is going to be a really choppy ride. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Bramo on World Cup. Oh, it's it's almost, it's, it's a little deeper than me. For <laughs> Seriously. It's a value add compared to me. tearing the U.S. team vintage, apart. Vintage, absolute vintage. Honestly. Like three days ago, she's an expert on American <laughs> football. Our jersey, our buying guys looking at the Just ceiling going, when is that? It turns around to me and says, what was your problem with the team? They were cute. <laughs> <laughs> Second. No, you are mischaracterizing and what you said. You were saying that the Spanish, the Spanish the team baitum. was passing and they just passed too much. They don't have a game after that. And I was saying, well, that seems to be the U.S.'s t a problem as well. No. They couldn't shoot. And you know what John said? John said, but the U.S. can't pass like that. So they don't even have that. They and I was saying they're a I mean, sweet you know, team. They're actually like really, I, I, I like our team. You know, speaking great. truth here, Bram. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> truth speaker. Back Amazing. on the rails. Do something. Equities right now <laughs> negative something. four tenths of one percent from New York City to <laughs> morning good morning good morning we have had warning after pain. warning on wall street in the last 24 hours it has been overwhelming we've heard from david solomon at goldman sachs who tom said bumpy ride ahead oh, come on we the heard economist from david Diamond solomon get hot to your son let's Looking go ahead to 2023 <clears throat> saying maybe mild to hard recession and that's what we're waiting for but at the moment we don't see it in the data the ism this week has been decent payrolls on friday was great which one is it? Where are we right now and where are we heading? Well, I, I'm in the camp of optimism here, but I'm looking on the screen, equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, and there's all this microanalysis on a jumble. Lisa had a great phrase for it this Wednesday. The bottom line is it's pricing recession. That's the summary, oil, bonds, real yield, da 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 Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. It's all pricing in this likelihood of recession. I can't get there. If you want two recession prints, <clears throat> two's tens on a yield curve. Negative 80-something basis points, yeah. most inverted yield negative curve 82. we've seen since the early 1980s. You want another one? The fact that crude <clears throat> is negative on the year for 2022, if you're just tuning in, I think this is just, this is just staggering, phenomenal. After the year that we've had, Lisa, to see crude negative for the year. I don't get it. And people are trying to say, well, you just aren't understanding recession. You aren't understanding what's being priced into the market. But as you've pointed out, John, it's not being priced into the energy stocks. So in the stock market, it's not seeing the same picture that uh, the, uh, the oil futures market is seeing. Who's right? A lot of people say that oil stocks perhaps have to come down. Why not the other way? Why don't they have oh, to go? Uh, why don't you see oil go up, yeah. given the fact that you are seeing? I mean, have you guys flown anywhere? Do you see how packed those airplanes are? Do you yes. see how much traffic can't there is? Get home. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, my, my answer on flying is that you can get there, but you can't get home. I thought Francisco Blanche had <laughs> the, the line of the day, if not the line of the week. And he called it spring or whatever. You know, the answer is he's looking for a rapid rebound and these depressed Brent and WTI prices. Chris Verone said it. Look at what's happening with the miners in London. BHP, Rio, through November. Yeah. Big, big gains. Look at what's happening with iron ore. He's looking to the China reopening story. <clears throat> Maybe some demand lease are kicking back in. Again, we saw progress in that, and it's not being priced into the market. It's not really making a dent on oil prices. Why didn't oil prices pop when we got a loosening in certain restrictions in China? Was it just because they thought that it was just a beginning? Was it people just basically, we've seen this story before? Got more easing of restrictions this morning, and futures are negative on the S&P. Let's whip through it. We're down a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Four days of losses on the equity market coming into Wednesday. Does it become five elsewhere in the bond market? Yields are higher by about a basis point, 354. Your euro stronger by a quarter of 1%, 104.93. And there's crude, Tom, 
low 70s, 74 on WTI. Yeah, 74, 73, 2 earlier. It's a grim chart. And again, they have Edward Morris and Francisco Blanche with us uh, back to back was a, a, a real joy. And they had some nuances there, some real differences. Um, I think Ed on a micro basis is really looking for d- <laughs> demand to come in. And demand hasn't come in. EIA out, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, with not a grim view, I think that's overplaying it, but a real caution about what global demand does. Lisa, WTI 74, Brent crude 79. It will be a story that we will continue to track. Also today, we are watching 10 a.m. To me, the Bank of Canada rate decision has been one of the most underplayed events all year. It has set the tone. It has been out front of other central banks. Do they downshift to 25 basis points in their seventh consecutive rate hiking cycle, given how hard yields have gone and how much, particularly their housing market, has started to roll over? We will get that decision at 10, 1030 a.m. We get the EIA crude oil inventory report. We've been talking about the conundrum. Why have oil prices come down so much? Are inventories start to, starting to build a sign of a lack of demand or are they actually declining? Showing what we've seen all year, which is actually inventories are still pretty tight. Again, this is what Francisco Blanche was saying, that actually you could see a real pop up in oil prices because of that lack of resilience, that lack of buffer. And at 3 p.m., we get October U.S. consumer credit data on the margin. This will actually really determine how much spending power consumers have. We have seen a decline in disposable incomes, particularly on the lower income brackets. Can people borrow? Can they just charge it and not pay it back for a while? Is that what we see, an ongoing increase in the credit card uh, outstandings? And, and to me, John, that's been one of the main question marks underpinning this recovery, and it ties back to the oil story. People have money to spend, and that is the reason why you are seeing uh, a lot of these economic data points come in stronger than expected. Is it being depleted slowly? And Lisa, thanks for that, because it's a key question. I think we've got a hint from that from Brian Moynihan of Bank of America, Tom, just a hint that maybe... We're starting to see that cushion be depleted. Megan <clears throat> Green wrote in the Financial Times yeah, earlier, was sharp. earlier yeah. this month and said something similar. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a lot of framework going on here. But my answer is, and we'll have some outlooks today as we do always in December. There's way, You had it best, John. I quoted you like four times in the 9 o'clock hour yesterday. You nailed it. You said it's cute. It's cute to say too cute for 23. In a strategy game. I, I just Way too cute. totally disagree with this approach. Uh, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research was on top of that as well. <laughs> what do you say? He said we're too cute for 23. I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Anytime. It was on your other property. Well, you know, you're sort of like 10 minutes with me and 10 minutes out. Yeah, you know. Put this in a headline an outlook that's different to all the other outlooks. Alessio De Longis of Invesco joins us right now. Alessio, increased <laughs> portfolio risk. We're overweight equities. So let's just get straight to it. Alessio, why are you guys going overweight equities? Look, a recession is not a question of if, it's a question of when. And we do think that a recession will come at some point, maybe in late 2023. The point is that between now and then, markets still experience very large fluctuations, both equity markets and credit markets. And when you look at the type of events that are, that are likely to occur, the type of news flow between now and then, There is plenty of reasons to expect that between the viable lags of monetary policy and that recession, the news flow will be supportive of cyclical assets in the end of at the end of this year. So now December and Q1 of next year. Look at the news out of China. Is it a full reopening? No. But is it the right direction of travel? Yes. When you look at um, equities or um, uh, risky credit, the the attractiveness for a cyclical rebound here is to us. There is there is some element there. When you look at the Fed that is looking to signal a pause in the tightening cycle. Uh, while those recessionary prints are not coming yet, that is likely to bring good news to the market. You guys talked about oil, oil coming down. That is likely to bring down inflation. So if you find yourself with, over the next three months, no recessionary prints in the economy yet, and high credit spreads, falling inflation, falling oil prices, and a Fed that signals a pause, I wouldn't necessarily want to be in front of that, waiting for that deterioration in the economy. Well, I see on a global basis, but almost a transatlantic basis. If we have disinflation, yet not down to 2%, let's agree on that, we still have nominal GDP. Is that enough to support the market away from the gloom and that we've got better nominal GDP where revenues at least survive? That is a great point, Tom, and it's something that I know you you have emphasized in the past, and I think with with huge merits. 
we always focus on real GDP when the reality is that we, we should focus on nominal earnings and hence nominal GDP. Now, inflation is likely to come down, so nominal GDP will also come down. But uh, the reason why, despite all the, the, the doom that we have seen, um, earnings have held up and, and equities have held up is primarily because stocks are an inflation hedge, some better than others. But having a healthy rise of inflation, which certainly isn't this one, but if inflation comes down to 3 4% and the real GDP growth holds up, that is not a terrible environment for equities and is, is certainly a good environment for risky credit. Alessio, how much is this basically a bet that consensus is wrong, that we're not going to get the recession in the first half, that it'll get pushed out and that you'll actually see more strength for longer and you don't want to miss that? Is this basically pushing against what everyone's saying, which is a bad first half and a good second half and saying it could be the opposite? I think that's a very good summary. Look, throughout 2022, we were in the camp that the recession risk were way, well above 50 percent. It didn't materialize. Our model, our modeling methodologies told us that something was changing and was not delivering. And we are now at an inflection point. How long will that last? It's, it's hard to say. It's not the beginning of a new cycle. We are going to get a recession, but I think it's exactly your point. We've been waiting for the second half of 2022. Now we're waiting for the first half of 2020, right. 2023. <clears throat> what if it's later than that? And, um, and I think that's exactly the dynamic here. We are experiencing a double dip soft patch and, and this tango between the Fed, right. between monetary policy and the economy is where this, this tension is. And at this moment, I think with the recession call should be pushed further out. Very quickly here, Alessio DeLongas and Jonathan Farrell with us here uh, today. We've got to talk about how Italy changes to rejoin the World Cup mix. It's the first time they missed John since 1958. Well, you missed the there last one, too. There was a huge too. Swiss one. Okay, I didn't know that. But <laughs> the answer is you two are watching this. How does a country, how does a team re, restructure themselves to get the 2026? I've got to be honest, Tom, it's kind of odd because the team was pretty decent. Just won the European Championships. Yeah. Missed two stupid penalties in qualifying, and they had ties that killed. Uh, them. Yeah, just it was just it was kind of odd. It was ridiculous. I still think the talent's there, and I think Alessio, what there. do you think? I think John is right. We were still celebrating the the Euro 2020 uh, win, and we forgot to pay attention and qualify next time. But it, it's a sad miss to World Cups in a row. That's Your Italian brutal. World Cup coverage. That was it. That was the extent of it. 30 seconds. I don't think we want to do any longer than that. <laughs> Alessio, before you run, sir, I wanted to squeeze one in. Just be hyper specific for us. Broad, yes, overweight equities. Get specific for me. Give me a call for next year. Where do you want to take that risk specifically? Uh, emerging markets, emerging markets yeah. will perform developed markets, especially in the first half of the year. And we like uh, value and small and mid caps. Alessio, thank you for leaving us with that. Yeah, EM Tom. Weak EM dollar presumption, year. the break yeah, of this strong dollar, dollar path. Story, sure. You know, that's that's the call on EM if you believe in it. Coming up, Brent Schutte. We'll ask him about it. The CIO at Northwestern yeah. Mutual Wealth Management. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Incumbent Democratic U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock has won re-election in the Georgia runoff. Warnock defeated Republican Herschel Walker with a little more than 51 percent of the vote. Walker had been handpicked by former President Trump. Warnock's victory allows Democrats to hold a real majority in the Senate with 51 seats. Two of Donald Trump's companies have been convicted in a criminal tax fraud trial in New York. They were found guilty of engaging in a scheme that allowed executives to evade taxes on company paid perks for more than a decade. The former president wasn't charged, but prosecutors told the jury he knew exactly what was going on. In China, it's the major shift from the COVID zero policy. Today, Beijing eased a range of restrictions aimed at preventing transmission of the virus. They included allowing some people to quarantine at home instead of in centralized camps. Plus, authorities have scrapped virus tests to enter most public venues. China's government has been under pressure to change its approach. In Germany today, more than 3,000 law enforcement officials conducted raids aimed at breaking up what authorities called a coup attempt. According to prosecutors, they detained 25 people linked to a far-right terrorist group that wants to overthrow the government. It's called the biggest ever raid targeting right-wing extremists in Germany. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
American manufacturing is back, folks. American manufacturing is back. Apple had to buy all the advanced chips from overseas. Now they're going to bring more of their supply chain here home. The United States is better positioned than any other nation to lead the world economy in the years ahead if we keep our focus. This is going to be absolutely fascinating. That was the president of the United States yesterday in Phoenix, Arizona. TK, the beginning of something big, you think? Uh, my number one phrase I love to say is I stand corrected, and I stand corrected on the idea of manufacturing in America. I thought some of the conversations we had yesterday showed the import of this, even if it's out a long time. Bringing right. it back on shore, near-shoring is a, another phrase you oh, hear a lot good. of now. Very Mexico could be the winner there. You get that from McKinsey? Yeah. <laughs> is it a McKinsey phrase? I, th I don't know. Clearly, things are changing, Tom, in a material things way. Things are changing. It's the scale of it. It's the billions of it. But what I think it really says is the success of some of these American geographies that can actually execute this. Could you see a $4 billion semiconductor plant and pick your 20-mile region outside New York City? I don't think so. Ed Ludlow yesterday caught up with him <clears> about <throat> Apple, and he used this phrase, de-risking the supply chain. He kept saying it, de-risking the supply chain. And people, when they think about de-risking the supply chain, they're thinking about taking China out of the supply chain. You just wonder how much more of this we're going to see, Tom, in the years to come, and maybe even decades. <clears throat> well, uh, there it is, and the president with a splash yesterday, and of course it was noted he went to uh, Arizona instead of Atlanta, where there was a very important election with a result. Our Joseph Matthew joins us right now. So, uh, Joe, i got to ask you about Sondheim yesterday. You talked to the guy that counts the votes as well. What did you learn from the Secretary of State of Georgia just before we heard that Mr. Warnock won? Well, it's interesting you ask that. They were just in the process of counting when I spoke with him. And Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, told us on Bloomberg Radio that it was likely the end of the line for runoff elections here in Georgia. This is important. We've talked about this. Georgia is not the only state that holds runoffs, but it has roots in Jim Crow. Going back to the 1960s, put in place here in Georgia to suppress the black vote. Here we are in 2022 with two black nominees fighting against each yeah. other for a United States Senate seat. And a lot of questions about why this is still in place now. In, That's a conversation that will be had in the General Assembly here in Georgia. In your travels there, what have you learned about early voting, early voting of the first Tuesday of November, early voting of this runoff? What's new? Yep. It made the difference. And what's new is Republicans are on board, I think, now this morning, looking back at the last couple of weeks in which early voting was discouraged by some, including Donald Trump, who handpicked and endorsed Herschel Walker. You cannot win elections like this when you rely on same day turnout. That was a big part of the story here. Raphael Warnock went into Election Day with a huge lead. It turned out to be insurmountable with nearly two million people voting early. You add those who turned out yesterday, another record vote. He won the suburbs. We told you that's where we would be looking. Those northern suburbs of Atlanta chose Raphael Warnock over the Trump-endorsed candidate. And that's where we stand this morning. Uh, Joe, how much is this really a repudiation of Donald Trump's leadership over the Republican Party? And I say this as we hear the talking points out of the Republican Party become there are lots of potential candidates. It's important to have a robust field. Nobody's willing to come out or not very many Republicans are willing to come out and say Donald Trump should not run. Well, we're hearing more of those people come out this morning. Not so much that he shouldn't run. Anyone can run for president, but he may not get very far. We'll be curious to see how that looks in the new year, assuming Joe Biden does, in fact, announce his run for president. But look, Republicans are angry this morning. They see a missed opportunity here in a candidate that never could quite get the job done here and an overhang by Donald Trump that, look, in Georgia is a big deal. Donald Trump had a very corrosive relationship with the Republican Party here in this state, and it played out last night. Even though he didn't show up with Herschel Walker, his fingerprints were all over this campaign here. You can look at this a couple of different ways. Republicans are also wondering, what if there was a different candidate? This was still a pretty close race. They're within 100,000 votes. There were times when Herschel Walker was ahead in the count last night. If this had been a different candidate, knowing Republicans won every other statewide race in Georgia, we could be having a very different conversation today. Hey, Joe, wonderful to catch up, as always. Joe Matthew there from Georgia. You spent much time in Georgia, Tom. Love it down there. I have not. I've spent a little the, bit of get time Get some there. barbecue down in Georgia. Yeah, I went deep into Georgia. I made it to the Four Seasons at Oh, that's how Atlanta. deep you went. That's how deep I went okay, to Georgia. Great. That's the extent of your tour. <clears throat> I just spent, I got to Nashville a lot, but I just didn't get south didn't get 
down there. Southers, they say. Emery Horton with us as well, our Bloomberg Washington uh, correspondent joining us this morning. What are the ramifications, Anne-Marie, up on Capitol Hill this morning after one more vote for the Democrats in the Senate? Well, this is actually huge for the Democrats. I mean, th this was, again, as I said yesterday, it wasn't a need to have, it was a nice to have. But this quote, this fact from 538 stood out to me this morning. It's the first time since 1934 that no incumbent senator from the president's party lost re-election. So if you look at these midterms overall for 2022, this was a huge win for President Biden, especially when you had the lead up to it, thinking that it was going to be a red wave, it was going to be a referendum on the Biden administration. I would say that more so than Warnock last night, I honestly think this was a huge victory for Joe Biden. If President, former President Trump does not run again, will current President Biden run again? <laughs> we have known that he has been reluctant to say he won't run again, uh, particularly because he believes that he is the only person who could win again versus the former President Trump. Listen, I can't get into the hypotheticals with uh, President Biden if, if or not if President Trump runs. But what we do know now is that the former president said that he is going to run, right? And if that is how the playing field is at the moment, then I do think you will see Biden step in. And already Ron Klain said that. But Lisa, you also made a very good point yesterday, which was the fact that Biden, even if he does, even if he decides in the very end he's not going to run, he cannot say that. He has a legislative agenda. He wants to get through the next two years. He wants to try to work with Republicans. We kind of see that already happening with the defense spending uh, bill, and that legislation uh, text hit hit the wires last night. He cannot say he's not going to run, right? So even if he plans on not doing it, he's coming out doing it. But he has said almost to him in the press, he just wanted to talk to his family. Ron Klain said it. He will be running. I, if right. President Trump backs out, then we have to take another look at it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, we're now past the midterm elections. We have a, a sense of what the shakeout will be. Oil prices are at the lowest. Gasoline prices are at the lowest level going back to early this year. Is it time? And I keep asking this because this is what a lot of people are wondering for the U.S. to step in and start buying crude. Is this time to start moving away from some of the policies that led to the outcome that they wanted, which was lower gasoline prices and perhaps trying to reduce the cost of living? Well, we're certainly closer to the U.S. wanting to do that now than we were, say, a few months ago. But I think there's just still too many unknowns. And you still have WTI trading above $70 a barrel. I think when it gets closer to 60 that's when you can see the U.S. have some real impetus to want to go out and fill up the SPR. But the unknowns are huge. We need to find out what's going on, number one, with demand in China in terms of COVID zero. Potentially this week's meeting with Xi Jinping and Mohammed bin Salman could shed some light on that. We also have a huge geopolitical risk that can change prices in a matter of moments. And that's not just Russia's uh, war in Ukraine, but it's also uh, issues going on and potentially uh, an Iranian, in Iran, a regime that's digging in its heels as it has protests continuing. There are a number of unknowns, and I think for this administration to want to go out and buy oil, it has to be closer to 60 than 70. AMH, great work as always. Coverage from DC on the crude market as well. Just a note, equities rolling over just a little bit. We're down seven tenths on the S&P, Lisa. Just a bit softer in the last 10 minutes or so. After a lot of the uh, pretty dire projections that we heard yesterday from the bank CEOs talking about a downturn, haven't been the best prognosticators. I have to say, Jamie Dimon was talking about 5% oh, oh, Treasury you, yields going me, back sir. about five years. And don't he was me. right. I mean, I guess it sort of depends on when. We could still see it. I mean, Do you know how to wind up, likely. Tom? You what? just do you, we you, you do talk we about bank CEOs <laughs> and economic uh, outlooks. Evidently. Oh, Rick, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Rick insane. Wagoner, General Motors, one of the first CEOs I talked to at Camp Bloomberg, Duke Economics. He can talk about economics. He's got cred to do that. He, he gave me a blurb for his book. I thank you. But Tom, in all fairness, aren't, aren't, well. aren't some of them? I think Brian Moynihan at Bank of America is very good at just referring back to the research department at the bank. Oh yeah, it, Brian. It, yeah, always yeah. Talk about They're his all chief different. Economist. Bill Winters over at Standard Charter I think sure. has a great uh, view as well. But just don't get me going. Do we ask Jan Hatzius about headcount out in Salt Lake City? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> It's you suggested we different. should. It's a little we different. Should. Jan Hatzius isn't going to try to I be think, the CEO. I think we want to know how they're preparing their business for the year ahead. Yeah. And if they're anticipating more okay, business and need to start for that or less and need to come back. I want to talk to Solomon about Marcus. You know, what are you I, I'm, do I'm aware. With Marcus? I'm aware.
Equities rolling over just a little bit, two hours away from the opening bell. Good morning to you. Wednesday morning, equities down across the board here on the S&P 500. Negative on the Nasdaq, slightly negative as well. Your S&P shaping up as follows. If we can get it on the screen for you, we're going to do that. We're not. It's the S&P now. If it was the Dow, it. they'd put it on the screen. There we go. What took so long? The Nasdaq. They were, wait, they were looking at the Dow. Down about 1%. <laughs> the S&P down 7 tenths to 1%. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they're doing? They're looking at the control, the control room. They're like, let's see what the market's really doing. They're looking at the Dow. Felix Salmon out with a great note for Axios. Just tell, showing tell me about it. how foolish the Dow is now, how antiquated it is. Mike McKee <laughs> sent me that email yesterday. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm thank pleased you, Mike, for Felix that. and Axios but are caught Felix, up. <laughs> like Felix actually, you know, is has got some major cred here. And it it's the it's the off I wonder if they're gonna make changes in the index to try to equilibrate. You know what, Tom, I don't know why they don't. Let's, yeah. let's say they stop price price weighting the index, right? And let's say they start market cap weighting the index Adjusting and just it, like sort do. of modernize yeah. the index. Yeah. I wonder how much more money would attract. Look, my problem with the Dow, and we've talked about You're it so many their times. Own book. I know the journal's talking. It's about. not about whether I think it's going to be up or down or whether it outperforms the S and P. It's the construction of it and the fact that given the last twenty years and this massive shift over the last decade specifically towards passive investing, there's just not that much money indexed this, to the Dow it's a cultural, in the same way it is to the S&P. It is cultural, but the, the, the gap has gotten wider in the last odd year. I, I get it. Yeah. The heritage of it in America is the if you want to know where it. the market is, you want to take the temperature like the of things, of you want to know where the Dow is. Italy. It's, it's but the way I describe there. it, Tom, is it's like asking for the weather for a town that people don't live in anymore. It kind of doesn't make well, sense to me. It, 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 where are we going to be in 20 years on this? I think we're going to be more towards yeah, your I thoughts. Don't, yeah, frankly. maybe. Mate, clearly things are shifting, <clears throat> Tom, but I'm with you. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be difficult to update this and change it, and then I think it has real relevance. 30 companies that are a cross-section of the American economy that yeah. aren't just big tech names. You get some industrials yeah. in the mix as well. I think it makes sense. I think that's good. That's great. Yeah, I don't know. Well, let's go. I'm not I mean, doing any more it's boards made up, because it's made up I, I don't of, think any boards are coming. It's made up of individual names, and Lisa's glancing at individual names. What are we glancing at today? What have we got, Bram? It's an odd week. <laughs> odd, odd well, equity I'm week. looking at Apple, and I don't really? know if you saw these stories about one of its suppliers, Murata, basically saying that. Yes. that it's not it's going to be failure. a supply-side issue. It's a demand-side issue. This is an issue with perhaps uh, not seeing people buy as many iPhones, and that's really going to be the main issue. That uh, Those shares down. One and a half percent. Toll Brothers shares are up just a little bit, which is not more notable in terms of the, the the scale of move. It's only up two tenths of a percent. But this is a home builder, a luxury home builder. It's amazing to see any gains on home builders given some of the dire uh, dire yeah, prognostications. Yeah, but they came out I, with a forecast that was better than expected, and that to me was notable. I, to radio, and I'm seeing this come up on TV. I still don't know what Carvana is. What is Carvana besides <laughs> they make stupid ads? What is Carvana? Uh, it's online car uh, car dealer. Use so cars, Tom. Use cars. Yeah, yeah, use yeah. cars. But this, the, the issue is is that there are other used car dealers, and they also have moved okay. online, and those shares are down. Uh, 19%, almost 20% in the pre-market trading, but there's been a lot of internecine fighting with some of the creditors. Okay, well, there we are, and we're, you know, we're going to see what we've got here. We may have Damien Sassar coming up here on this odd emerging market ballet that we have uh, in the last three days or so with weak dollar. Right now, with an incredibly important terse report, Victor York joins us now, Global Head of Credit Strategy at BNP Paribas. And Victor, thank you that you don't mince words. You talk about dispersion downgrades, defaults. Is it feasible we could have a Bloomberg total return bond index two years in a row with price down? Uh, it doesn't happen often, uh, but it does happen. Uh, you know, for credit in 2000, 2003, you had uh, almost three years of negative excess returns and 14, 15, something similar happened. So yeah, it's absolutely possible. Rare, but not impossible. Oh, I look at the not impossible. Well, I look at the not impossible, Victor, and it comes down to your really terse, terse language. Let's go to downgrades right now. Are the rating agencies behind the risk that's out there now? Uh, I suspect so. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm for credit at the moment because you know, Fed seems to be tilting and, uh, you know, fundamental seems to be fine. Uh, but we've had a lot of rate hikes already. And, um, you know, and what's also happening uh, is that corporates this year 
have been using up a lot of the liquidity buffers they built during COVID. Um, so they've gone from effectively a lot of liquidity to not much liquidity at all. And so what's going to happen as you go into 23 is you start refinancing a lot of debt, and that way you start building in um, uh, higher interest expense, and that way you start putting negative pressure on interest coverage ratios, and suddenly you're going to have a fundamental environment that the rating agencies are not going to like as much, and uh, that's when the downgrades start to happen. Right now, the consensus seems to be, Victor, that the, the next year really is going to be a year of investment-grade credit. You're going to see the deterioration in riskier credit and leveraged loans. But if you hold on and you hang on and you watch uh, benchmark rates come in, just simply because we do start to get some sort of downturn scenario, investment grade will be a sweet spot. How do you disagree or do you basically agree with that uh, consensus right now? I think uh, investment grade should outperform, uh, you know, the lower rated parts of uh, the credit market. But I mean, let's remember, right? So the enthusiasm here comes from the fact that suddenly you've got yields back in, you know, investment grade credit and spreads too, by the way. And, uh, you know, that's also obviously great for investors. Uh, it's not so great for corporate borrowers, uh, you know, so the investors yield is the corporate's uh, cost of funding, and that's gone up a lot. And um, <clears throat> Um, you know, normally what happens is that first you get a bit of rates risk uh, and then you move on to a bit of ratings risk. And uh, that transition, I think we still have um, ahead of us. Uh, you know, if you run the numbers, uh, you know, and put a bit of downward pressure on those interest coverage ratios. And then on top of that, you start adding a bit of uh, margin compression. And so you get a bit of EBITDA slow down uh, and suddenly leverage starts to go higher as well, uh, you are going to look at a fairly substantial amount of uh, downgrades. Uh, you know, we think, you know, about 100 billion or so of triple B rated U.S. corporates can lose their uh, rating and, um, and go non-investment grade. I don't think that's in the price. Uh, I actually think that's the blind spot right now and uh, where I think people can still be surprised. When you talk about surprise, there's a question about when it becomes a systemic risk. And we were speaking with Amy Wu Silverman yesterday of RBC Capital. And she said she's very concerned about the leveraged loan market as potentially being a node of systemic risk of some sort of more significant disruption. Do you see anything fundamentally that could drive that? The uh, I'm not sure I would call it systemic risk, uh, but I would call it a you know a canary in the coal mine, uh, if you like. You know the leverage loan market is probably the only market uh, where you could argue there was sort of a more meaningful deterioration in underwriting standards uh, over the last few years. And if you look at the lower rated part of the single B space, we think more than half those companies can end up next year with an interest rate coverage uh, of less than one. So that's basically the zombie definition. And, uh, and that means that you end up with a large number of uh, companies unable to meet their uh, current debt payments with their incomes at a time when the Fed is doing QT and we're essentially going to ration uh, credit a bit. Victor, we got Damien Sassar coming up, our, our main acts on emerging markets. And right now, we've clearly got a dollar tendency flat to weaker. We've got the idea again percolating that equities in, internationally in EM will do better than good. Tell us about the opportunity or risk in emerging market debt. Is that a place that it's so beat up, so cheap, you've got to own it, or is it still a minefield? It's not so beaten up that it's a home run, uh, but you're right. It tends to do well when uh, the dollar sells off. You can debate whether that's going to happen. That's not necessarily our view uh, immediately because you would slow down. So also tend to create a bit of safe haven status uh, around the dollar. Uh, but it's got a few things going for it. Uh, you know, one is obviously um, the dollar. The other one is China reopening. There uh, is no uh, part of the, uh, you know, the liquid part of the credit space that benefits as much from China reopening as uh, emerging markets. So those things probably suggest that uh, EM can outperform uh, developed market credit in the months ahead.
We heard the same thing from Alessio De Longis yeah. 40 minutes ago. Yeah. Victor, this was great. Victor Kjord there of BNP Paribas. Just to get you up to speed on the markets, we are down 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. It is interesting to see the equity market roll over and the dollar's not stronger. In fact, the dollar's weaker. Euro dollar 105.20 gets the euro at least. Euro dollar positive here, at least for a half of 1%. And this came after some better than expected GDP data out of the eurozone as well. So again, you've been asking how much is a dollar story and how much is the other side of the trade? And you are seeing euro strength here, which at 105.18 is notable to me. Is this an artificial reality compared to what we're going to see on inflation in what, John, six days, whatever it is? And Tuesday. And we could go down like we're going down now. OMG, it keeps us occupied. And then <laughs> boom, we go the other way. Would you like a sneak it's, peek of next week? Just a survey for CPI. Yeah. So month over month, this is our survey relative to the previous month. Our median estimate is 0.3%. <clears throat> previous month, 0.4. That's headline. Core, 0.3 versus 0.3. If you want the headline year over year, we're looking for a drop from 7.7 to 7.3. Headline, core okay. year over year. A meaningful looking for a drop move. from 6.3 to 6.1. And, of course, that comes 24 hours away yeah, from I the just... Fed decision. I, I'm just sort of worn out by the volatility now and that one week we're like, OMG, we're going down. And the next week, like Friday last week, was it? Or Thursday last week? I'm, boom, I'm with we you. Uh, what a difference a rally yeah. makes. It completely changes the yeah. way everyone talks about a market and then a sell-off. Yeah. All of a sudden, everyone's super negative. It's hard landing. This is why the, the old phrase, and we've heard it a million times, is right. that sentiment doesn't shape price. Price right. sen shapes sentiment, right? I think that that's fair. I just want to go back to the Apple story because Morgan Stanley just cut their expectations for their output and the sales uh -huh. of iPhones because of the recent warning from the supplier. This goes to the question that you're just talking about, which is how resilient is the consumer? That has been the defining yeah. feature between whether things are heating up or slowing down, yeah. as you put it yesterday. Very quickly, a landmark today. Boeing makes the last 747, seat 60J was my favorite seat. This is for Atlas Air, the cargo developers worldwide, John, 52 years on. That's it for the single best engineering invention of our life. You're emotional about this, I, It's a huge deal, huge deal. It is the queen of the skies. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock has turned back Republican Herschel Walker in Georgia's runoff election. Warnock was re-elected with a little more than 51 percent of the vote. His victory will give Democrats a 51 to 49 edge in the Senate, making it easier to legislate. Walker had been backed by former President Trump. China is retreating from wide-ranging COVID-0 policy that is blamed for damaging the economy. Beijing will now allow some people to quarantine at home instead of at centralized camps. It's also scrapping virus tests to enter public venues. COVID-0 pushed down consumer and business confidence and left people stuck in a cycle of outbreaks and lockdowns. Saudi Arabia is rolling out the red carpet for Xi Jinping today. The Chinese leader will visit the kingdom for several days and will take part in a regional summit with Arab leaders. According to the Saudi news agency, Xi is promising agreements worth some $30 billion. The trip comes two months after the Saudis snubbed President Biden's pleas for oil. The CEO of Euronext says there's a new normal in Europe. Stefan Bujna tells Bloomberg that firms are now listing outside London because the UK's financial capital has been declining since Brexit. Brexit was a big decision and big decision entails big consequences. London used to be the largest financial centre of the European Union and everybody liked it. Today London is the largest financial centre of the United Kingdom. What is happening is that companies that in under other circumstances would have considered being listed in London are listed outside of London. Several weeks ago, Paris overtook London as Europe's largest stock market. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. price point when it comes really painful is going to be below 65. We still have, and you just remarked on it, uh, the U.S. government having indicated it might start buying oil if WTI falls below 70. And I think that's the first test. Not at 65 yet, but we're getting closer. That was Ed Morse of City just yesterday. Crude year to date is negative on the year.
as of earlier this morning. Just absolutely ridiculous. Here's a snapshot of the price action for you. <coughs> right now slightly positive on the session on WTI $74.37 up by a little more than a tenth of one percent yields a bit higher by a single basis point 354 on a 10 year and this is interesting just breaking down that correlation between stronger dollar and risk appetite Tom equities are down seven tenths of one percent dollars weaker not stronger you're yeah. a dollar here, one of five twenty one, <clears throat> positive a half of one percent. There's an oddity to it to say the least. And you know, idiosyncratic Turkish lira weakens out as it has quietly, and that's a separate story. But the big story to me, John, is we're addicted to these big figure moves on strong dollar, what we saw in shock for six months. Maybe it's over. Is China underpinning that move? Is yeah. that what's happening here? Well, and again, with Yuan under seven, we have a strong renminbi 6.98 on Yuan. This is a joy. Joining us right now, Damien Sassauer with Bloomberg Intelligence, chief emerging markets apologist. We're thrilled he could join us <laughs> today. Credit Suisse years ago had a famous chart of with little flutters up. For those on radio, I'm curving my hand up of where everybody got wrong, the interest rate call of the Fed. You can make the equivalent chart in your world where finally dollar weaker EM up. We're there right now once again. Is this time for real? You know, my mom worked at Credit Suisse back in the day. You know, she worked for Larry Fink back there, first boss. Really? Yes, yeah, Lawrence that. Fink. And were they doing ESG? Mortgage then? backed securities. They weren't doing EM then, but they were, you know. So look, I, I don't want to go off topic. No, that's surveillance. We'd never it, want to do you that. You know, I'm, I want to stick to the base. I mean, look, it's going to be a tale of two halves. You guys have been saying it all week long, right? It's the first half, which is going to be an absolute mess. And if the U.S. does go into recession, you expect spreads to go wider and equities to decline. And that's that second half when. China's supposed to reopen. And for emerging markets, I think that's really what you have to hang your hat on. I personally remain a little suspect on it. But if you right. look at dollar yuan, certainly that's what's pushing uh, the broad dollar index a little bit weaker here. But I remain suspect on euro. I mean, I, I have to say it's, it's the yuan and the euro. That's what's going to affect EM currencies writ large. And I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I got to say, I'm a little bit sanguine on the euro. I don't think it's going higher here. Is the opportunity in the risk of equities or is there any kind of stability and risk reward in EM debt? Oh, yeah. No, EM debt, FX hedged. I mean, look, it's got a high beta, high correlation to U.S. Treasuries. If you're of the belief that U.S. Treasuries are going to do 7 to 10 percent in the year ahead, which we are, and a lot of people are, like J.P. Morgan and other smart people, then uh, EM, uh, EM rates, FX hedged, should do 7 to 10 percent as well. What's the most important factor behind the EM call next year, China or the Fed? Uh, it's definitely China. I mean, well, look, I mean, it's China in terms of EM currencies. It's the Fed in terms of beta. And so, look, let's be let's be clear. If you think of EM in terms of credit and equities, the high beta elements of it, it's going to be the Fed. But if you think of it in terms of rates, if you think of it in terms of EM local debt, you've got to kind of look at the currency. You've got to look at dollar yuan. You've got to look at euro dollar. And, you know, it's two sides of the same, same coin. You know, euro dollars really had a greater impact on EM currencies over the last year. It's not always been that way. It's been dollar yuan for the better part of the last five years. Are we moving back into that beta regime? I would say so. Probably. How would you frame it currently? Is this the path towards a full reopening or is this just easing restrictions to keep a couple of people, in fact, more than a couple, <laughs> happier after protesting a few weekends ago? Jonathan, you're not asking that question. It's sort of a rhetorical question, right? Because Which one you is know it? it's the latter. You know it's what I'm going to say. You I think mean, I've it's... got the answers? See, I haven't got the answers. Come on. <laughs> you know, basically Look, I, dished I, up I, on a the plate. The China reopening, I, I, and don't get me wrong, they will reopen. It's just going to take a lot longer than we would have otherwise thought. And it's going to look very, very different than we've seen in years past because of the property crisis, because of everything that's going on on the ground and the confidence or lack thereof in the, co in the economy. So, you know, look, I think China's a big deal. I think Asia and probably curve flattening in Asia is probably a trend you want to play at the current moment. But I think um, I think low yielders in Asia, yeah, I mean, that's probably where you want to park your money um, amidst the crisis that I see coming in the first half of next year. One of the reasons why people think this is because a lot of the developing world raised rates ahead of the Fed yeah. and raised rates a lot more quickly. And we're much out, out front of what we see now from the United States. Can they be the first to start cutting and actually bring investment to their country, not go the other direction? Can that be supportive at a time when you don't normally get the same kinds of currency responses to cutting and hiking? Well, Lisa, we all want to think so, right? We all want to play the receivers in places like Peru, Czech, Colombia, Chile, and Brazil. Those are the five economies that are probably going to cut rates in the new year. The extent to which they cut rates, I think we're only thinking cumulatively over the course of 2023, 200 basis points, if that, across all of those five economies or six. I mean, that's not a lot of rate cuts. So if you're playing for receivers, you're not going to really get the juice there, I don't think. I think really for me it's about spreads. I mean, it's going to be about credit spreads. And as you move into U.S. recessions, 
you know, we haven't seen it yet, you know, spreads gap wider, you know, and I think that's what, you know, we're all going to be looking for in the coming year, yeah. So let's talk about your mother. You mentioned her. No, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but I'm kind of not. No, but going way. Way. She, 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 hired, Hold on a she hired Rob Capito for Larry Fink back at uh, First Ball. Really? Wow. Day. Okay, but before yeah. we get into you know, Rob's a getting into all of that, yeah, I am curious about the experience of the trader out there yeah. on some of the desks right now entering an incredibly difficult, very different reality where we have <laughs> a motley picture of rates and inflation. Yeah, no, what's the average age? Probably 24 or 5 is your average. So what's the consequence of that? I mean, well, look, a lot of them haven't lived through a lot of the crisis. We have admittedly, I'm not trading the market anymore every day, so I don't know how a lot of these markets are structured at the nuance, but, you know, I cut my teeth in the late 90s at Goldman Sachs and the short end of the curve during <laughs> repo and hicks and tri-party transactions. And for me, when you look at SOFR and you look at GC and you look at GC repo and you start to see some of the things happening there. We've been waiting for the cost of collateral relative to cash to start to move for now eight months. And we're finally seeing evidence of that. So in collateral, there's more collateral out there than cash, right? Because the Fed's tightening the screws. You know, that's when things start to break. That's when you see crowding out of other asset we're classes. That's when you see issue job. problems. You used the word crisis people. two minutes ago. It wasn't lost on me. Oh, damn it. Why did you use that word? Well, because look, there, look, debt to GDP and emerging markets really is at an all-time high. You know, Growth next year is going to be 2.9% across the whole of emerging markets. That's really, really low. Um, China, G China growth is going to be 4%, maybe. You know, these are not great levels relative to history. I wouldn't say they can start a crisis, but they are crisis levels. Now, admittedly, we talk about these distressed emerging markets out there, the Argentinas of the world, the Sri Lankas. I do think their maturity price profile will allow them to sort of get through next year, but there's a lot of pain to be had there. So, you know, right. I mean, I'm not, I say crisis only to kind yeah, of catch I the attention care. of your audience, but I don't know if it's really I don't care. Be. <laughs> you follow this That's why I asked. Well, that That's why I asked. Fair I'm, 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 I'm pleased you admitted it. Yeah. 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 Oh, come on. Just DeGrom's going crisis. to Texas and the rest. <laughs> the Aaron Judge Derby, he turned on $213 million opening day. Mm. They're now up to three hundred sixty million plus Is San Francisco and Yankees. What do you think? You I think four hundred. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, look, it could get there. I mean, look, what are they? Nine years, three sixty, something along those lines. I don't know why he'd play for the Giants. They don't have a short right field perch. I think he's probably gonna want to stay in New York. Um, but, but they, you know, the everybody says that says San Francisco. It's a lot of money. It's, I don't it's know. It's like if that's when Pharaoh right came to New York, it was a lifestyle decision. <laughs> Where's Derek Jeter? Get me Derek Jeter back in the short stuff. Have you watched the documentary on Derek Jeter? Amazing. Oh, it's Captain? awesome. So Loved awesome. it. It's just fantastic. He's such a class act. Aaron Judge apparently unhappy that they made that contract off the public, that number. Yeah. The 360. The, I, 200, I the 200 plus. Oh, the 213. The 200 yeah, plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he felt like it was like putting him in opposition And if you saw the, the captain, base, the Derek Jeter yeah. negotiations, it was the same thing. You know, they just signed Messing. Brian Cashman to another four years. So does somebody come out? Where are the Dodgers and the Angels in this? Could you see Otani and Judge? The Do I could see the Red Sox. I could see your Boston oh, Red they're Sox doing nothing. in there. They're like, a, they're like the oh, Italian they're soccer they're quiet. The they're like a slumbering giant up oh, there. Oh, please. Oh, stop come it. Come on in the frost. You're killing me. I'm still waiting for someone to explain the financial model of this. 300 million. Uh, it's when, when, when she the, had the best answer of anyone. <laughs> Lisa Stevie folks Cohen. and Stevie Cohen. No, in <laughs> all honesty, this is actually one of the oddities of the baseball market is the major markets have amazing retail uh, royalties, the, all of the products that they sell, incredible ticket sales. If you ever bought tickets, you know how expensive they are, and they're often sold out. Very. Season ticket holders, all of these mass, uh, mm -hmm. and also contracts with, with cable companies, all of these revenue streams that give them a lot of money that they can then throw after some of the top talent, is it worth it? That kind of goes to the whole Moneyball thing, and we can discuss even The American market time. is just absolutely massive. It's just amazing. I it's thought you guys did a great job with Maria, Maria earlier today. Did you see how was emotional that, that was? You were spot? really, <laughs> really, I thought you were really classy. The really sensitive. I, <laughs> the, the, the box and I had no idea what she was talking Dripping about. Dripping with sarcasm. It was amazing. It was amazing. The football is a very emotional thing. Like, obviously. The World Cup is deeply emotional. It, it, I've learned this, and seriously, will it be the same well, when it's in to, America? Sure, it will be. You have to realize that for a supporter of Spain, for like Maria Tadeo, she views their performance as how the rest of the world perceives her country. Like, that's really, really yeah. important. So as an individual of those countries, you believe that people will have a different perception of your country and where you're from because based on how that team performs at a single sport in a single game. So when I say Cup. half back to the fullback, back to the center, Maria doesn't like that. I think you're probably offending a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We should get that. We used to have that Simpsons <clears throat> clip, didn't we, on radio? Do you remember that? <laughs> Tommy used to Ties. introduce me and play that. Lots come back from break and play that clip. Joining us now.
<laughs> and I'd run off. <laughs> There's a hopeful scenario where you can get a soft landing, but we need to be realistic. I think most people are overly concerned with recession. It's very likely that inflation is going to be persistent on the core level for some time. The reality is that consumers are starting to run out of dough. When the Fed is tightening to the degree they are, it's restricting the amount of money that's out there. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, 8 o'clock for Global Wall Street. A sleepy Wednesday? No. We're going to blow up the show right now. Ian Lingen of BMO Capital Markets, John, just out with a brilliant, lengthy, piercing note. He says things are going to change. The two-year yield will go up, and that matters to every listener Every viewer. We've talked about Neil Dutter a lot from Renmac, who joined us last week and talked about a reacceleration in the U.S. economy. He believes yeah. there's a big disconnect between where people expect the economy to go and where it is right now. And he thinks it's going to be quite a messy, a messy close of that gap, which ultimately could lead, Tom, to high yields. Ben Jeffrey and Ian Lingen go into hyper detail here across the curve, looking at other assets as well. And they zero in and they just say it's just simple. There's going to be more twos. The short end is where to watch versus the 10-year benchmark, and that's going to give you perhaps greater inversion. So how does that two-year shape your view of the longer end? And to your point, does that lead to further inversion? We've got Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo looking potentially for a level of 475 on a 10-year next year. Equities for me, Tom, looking out next year, going through all the 2023 outlooks. Bit of a snooze. 4K seems to be the average. I hear it a lot. Well, We're going to go snooze, down. But... We're going to come back up. The yield calls, though, <clears throat> with the likes of Steve Major at HSBC looking for 250 right. year end 23. Wells Fargo looking for 475 on a 10 year year end 23. You get the feeling someone's going to be very wrong on that bond market next year, don't you? This is the conundrum into the oddest year of outlooks I've ever seen. And Lisa, we always know the Abramowitz world is out front of the equity world. There's no question about that. How dislocated do you see in your reading that bonds are from the equity market? Not so dislocated. I mean, honestly, you've seen resilience right now, at least over the past couple of weeks in certain credit markets. From a broader level, though, on the front end, how much momentum is there that this Federal Reserve has to stymie? How long can it continue? One of the big distinctions for next year is whether we get a recession in the first half the second half or the first half of 2024? <clears throat> How far are we pushing it out yeah. based on some of the strong consumer spending and the strong inflationary reads we've been getting? And we heard this from these executives yesterday, Mr. Diamond over on the Death Star, uh, Mr. Solomon with Shanali Bassick here, given the economic line of recession, and yet there's economists like Neil Dutta, like Solomon's Jan Hatzius, John, that just say no it's a lesser likelihood than the gloom that's on my screen this morning. So you've got the economic data, you get CPI next Tuesday. Then it's all to about me, the everything. Fed's interpretation of the data on Wednesday and how they project forward from there. I'd go further <clears> than that. It's also about the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell specifically, his view on risk management. And I keep going back to this. I think this is the key driver of markets right now. The Fed's view of risk management when it comes to Fed funds. Do they think the bigger risk is over-tightening or under-tightening? And what emphasis does he use in the news conference? At the last news conference, he repeatedly talked about the risk of under-tightening. He talked about asymmetric risk, right. and they talked about the ability to correct over-tightening. Now, I know many people sat there and listened to Chairman Powell at Brookings last week and said, no change, no change, nothing. But for a lot of people in the market, they did see a shift, and it was a shift in emphasis as he talked about and an unwillingness, or at least the lack of desire to over-tighten. I wanted to talk to uh, Damien Sassar about this, but Aaron Judge's chit-chat was more important. Lisa, what's percolating out there is not a liquidity crisis, but I'm going to call it a liquidity concern out in the next year. That's I don't think it's in the zeitgeist, yes, but it's percolating. Crisis was a better word because it gets everybody's attention. If, how do you <laughs> discern something that is a problematic yeah, uh, development? We're already seeing that. The big price swings that we've seen, the big yield swings in benchmark rates, kind of shocking. Well, let's do the data here. John, I'm going to look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. It's still not where Mr. Paul's. It's a little better than the accommodation of two days ago, but negative 0.59 uh, is nowhere near where Chairman Paul wants it. I that. mentioned Chair Powell last week at Brookings, we've taken back all of those gains. 
after that address by Chairman Powell. We are back to the levels before he spoke on the S&P, and we're negative this morning by six-tenths on the S&P and much more so on the Nasdaq. Yields a little bit higher by a couple of basis points. Tom, your 10-year, 354.95. It is a, j a jumble. Some would say almost inchoate here, what we're talking about here, all the backs and forth. Someone that needs to distill this is with Northwestern Mutual Wealth Manager. Brent Schutte joins us now, their Chief Investment Officer. Brent, did you take your outlook for 2023 from 55 pages down to 12? I mean, are you, are you going short and sweet here, or are you right in war and peace here on what we're going to see next year? Right, I think we're more on the short and sweet type and trying to be understandable and, and make sense. And, and to me, I, I think, you know, we're switching from right now inflation fears to recession fears. I hear the word recession quite a bit, and this is what we thought would happen. So if you think about it, Inflation fears drove us lower till October 12th. That was the day before core CPI topped. And so I think what you're seeing now is the commentary that the Fed has done too much. You're seeing it in the bond market. The bond market is telling you that inflation is a thing of the past and that the Fed has done too much. And that's what I think likely drives trading for the next few months, where you see these re recession fears come out. Once we see that inflation does not survive a recession uh, and that the Fed will pause when they actually see jobs being right. lost, then I think you can move higher in a, in a more sustained pace. If we agree that inflation coming down is what's called a highly stochastic, it's pointy, folks. It goes up, up, doom and gloom, and then it comes down rapidly as it did twice after 1947 and other times as well. How does the allocation or outlook of your investment recommendations change if inflation only comes down to 4% and not to the proverbial 2%? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what most people are saying right now, largely because the New York Fed UIG underlying inflation gauge shows 4% inflation as being kind of the more persistent part of it. And so, I, you know, I, I just don't think that we stay at 4%. I think it does pull back. I don't think we're going below 2 I don't think we're going back to the last decade that we had where we persistently worried about deflation. Um, that, to me, was not, you know, inflation wasn't a relic of the past. That was how we were positioned then. But we are certainly positioned more for it coming down uh, in the next uh, few quarters. Uh, for example, we, we actually upped our allocation or increased our duration towards fixed income in the middle of October because the Barclays aggregate was yielding 5% versus 175 at the start of the year. Bonds now provide real value. Uh, they provide a hedge against downturns in equities caused by recession. Uh, and that's where we've kind of focused on the bond side. On the equity side, we're still on things that are cheaper. Um, that has been what has worked this year. That has been what I think will continue to work next year. And so we own the S&P 600. It trades at 13 times next year's earnings that have already been marked down by uh, 14, 15%. Mark them down 10 more percent or 10 more. Uh, we still are at 15 times. Uh, and so on things like that, and I dare say international developed is becoming more attractive because I think the dollar will fall next year. So, Brent, do I hear 60-40 going into 2023? Is that why I hear? 60-40 was never dead. It's not dead. It needed commodities in it. We had those. Uh, and now I think it's actually going to be a much better place going forward. I mean, uh, equities have done the heavy lifting, lifting for the last 10 years. Now bonds offer some value. And so certainly they will be a, a way that holds up the 60-40 as we push forward. Uh, into 2023. Lisa, that's a big change, isn't it? Coming into 22. Do you remember that? 60-40's dead. Yeah. It's over. And 60-40, let's be clear, this year. <laughs> Brutal. It was devastated. Brutal. And how much do people buy that 60-40 is back, especially after the brutality that we just saw? Well, Brent, that's the question. How perceptive are other people about the thing that you see? How receptive are they towards what you're saying? Yeah. I, I always like to hope to be a, a little bit contrarian in nature because I found that's usually the right place to be. So, you know, I, I do think people are worried just because the 60-40 hasn't worked uh, and that narrative has been that it's dead. I think most people think of the 60-40, unfortunately, as just large cap growth and, and investment grade bonds. I think you need to have things like commodities and there's something that we've owned because we didn't think inflation was dead. Um, something like small cap, something like international stocks, which is no one wants to own those just because they haven't done well. But if I look back at economic cycles post-1980, Every single economic cycle had different leadership. The S&P and EFA alternated. I'm not suggesting that it has to be, but I think as you push forward, you're in a different type of environment where inflation will be above 2%, where there will be different worries, where there will be shortages on different sides of the economy. And I think that's going to drive us forward. And I think 60-40, if you look historically, um, going back to 1926, uh, we've only had four years where the bond market was negative when the stock market was negative. Brent, you and mentioned- those were all dictated by high inflation, which I don't think we're gonna have next year. Brent, you mentioned commodities, and let's end there, because we've been talking about the divergence between energy stocks and other commodity equities that are doing very well, and then you're looking at a crude price that's the lowest going back to December of 2021. What gives there? Can you have conviction to continue buying energy equities in the face of prices that are dropping in the crude space? 
there will still be companies that make money within the crude space. I think you just need to focus on picking the right ones. Certainly, um, the easier money has been made in energy. Um, that's been the sector that has done well over the past few years because no one wanted to own it. Now you have more people wanting to own it. And so I, I, I don't think that it's a, a all negative, but I certainly think the easy money has been made uh, as you look forward. Uh, and certainly the price of oil is still something that is going to be highly variable based upon uh, what is happening in the economy. I think right now it reflects the reality that we are moving more towards a recession. Um, certainly, I think the good news is we've had rolling recessions over the past year, just like we had a rolling recovery. And I think that helps take the starch out of any recession as we push forward, as does the state of the U U.S. consumer, uh, which is still in good shape. It's always easy money after the fact, isn't it, Tom? They, they never tell me ahead of time it's going to be easy money looking yeah. ahead to the year ahead. I, I think the best you can do, John, it's a really important insight. And, and, and the best you can do is try to gauge consensus. And it's not going against consensus when consensus is sort of kind of like. Yeah. It's when there's a massive consensus bet. And the question is, are we there now? Brent Shuddy of Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management. Brent, you know I'm joking at the end. It's great to catch up, sir, as always. 60 40s back. That's the headline there from Brent looking well, ahead to. Four years out of umpteen that he mentioned here. And. You know, you you got to go against it. I mean, it, when was the last time we had a bond market? I mean, Lisa, two years in a row back to back of the grimness of Oof. this year in bonds. It's been brutal. It's, and it's not visualized. You know, this is what a lot of people are saying is that 6040 has both problems My, potentially going for it <clears throat> next year. When did we last see, John, as you've framed out beautifully, the market SPX at 4000 right now, uh, 3923. And we're going to move 42 points in the next 12 months. <laughs> it's going to be quite a trip on the way. Savita Subramanian. It's going to be a journey. I'm catching up with Savita from Bank of America. A journey. A journey, an emotional one. I'm catching up with Savita in about an hour from now. And Savita thinks, bear case, the downside, you could see 3K. Can you imagine that? Well, Mike Wilson agrees. Yeah. I would ask well. her, I think she's provided world leadership on ESG. I'd ask Savita Subramanian. Oh, she's awesome. That whole team is that. The future of ESG. It's great to see Gapen over there as well, you know. Yes. Over at BFA. Yeah, a good year. Lined up with Savita. Coming up very shortly, we'll catch up with Henry Trace from Vader Partners. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Incumbent, incumbent Democratic U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock has won re-election in the Georgia runoff. Warnock defeated Republican Herschel Walker with a little more than 51 percent of the vote. Walker had been handpicked by former President Trump. Warnock's victory allows Democrats to hold a real majority in the Senate with 51 seats. Two of Donald Trump's companies have been convicted in a criminal tax fraud trial in New York. They were found guilty of engaging in a scheme that allowed executives to evade taxes on company paid perks for more than a decade. The former president wasn't charged, but prosecutors told the jury he knew exactly what was going on. In China, it's a major shift from the COVID zero policy. Today, Beijing eased a range of restrictions aimed at preventing transmission of the virus. They included allowing some people to quarantine at home instead of in centralized camps. Plus, authorities have scrapped virus tests to enter most public venues. China's government has been under pressure to change its approach. In Germany today, more than 3,000 law enforcement officials conducted raids aimed at breaking up what authorities called a coup attempt. According to prosecutors, they detained 25 people linked to a far-right terrorist group that wants to overthrow the government. It's called the biggest ever raid targeting right-wing extremists in Germany. And Southwest Airlines is reinstating its dividend after a halt of more than two years. It becomes the first major carrier in the U.S. to resume shareholder payouts after they were suspended during the pandemic. That was one of the conditions of receiving government financial aid. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. As many of you know, we work with TSMC to manufacture the chips that help power our products all over the world. And we look forward to expanding this work in the years to come as TSMC forms new and deeper roots in America. Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, the stock this morning down by a little more than one full percentage point. Lisa, you've been looking at this. I think we've been focused on the supply side story, but it's the demand 
around the Apple iPhone where I think there's just a little bit of uncertainty. Yeah, that, that basically, even if there are some real problems with supply, uh, that it doesn't really matter because demand will overtake that and won't necessarily offset that. Right. That's what we've been hearing from a number of producers. And also we saw Morgan Stanley downgrade Apple as a result of that. I've been doing my channel checks. Can you guys smile? TK, like we on a new iPhone, we, we get along. honestly. A channel you check. are like a child you? with a new John. toy. John, is it that good? The only one in the house that doesn't have a new Pro 14 whatever is kennel feed. Did you do Even the family plan? Bill. Yeah, I did the family plan. T-Mobile, they, they say I'm just like magenta. So I'm fascinated by whatever. this. Is that where yeah. all these big sales yeah. are coming from? Okay. It's through the carriers in America. Stop the show. Henrietta Trey's has taken notes in Washington. We got to, you know, get to it. As quick as I can, when somebody tells me this costs $1,200, I just laugh at them. You get in. The gimmick is you get in for nothing or near nothing. Because the phone companies are battling. Tim Cook, we show him great. Glad he was in Arizona. We should be talking to the head of Verizon, yep. head of AT and T, head of Magenta, Mr. Legere, and the rest of the geniuses at T-Mobile, because they're the ones driving these sales in America. China, I don't know so much. Same thing in the UK. Similar story. I'm gonna I'm gonna get you out on 48 megapixels. I megapixels. You know, okay. Driving technology forward. Should we do a data check here before we go to Henry? I mean, if you want to do that briefly, sure. It's a caution on the screen. Apple's down 1.4%. Thank you. Futures are negative 25 on the S&P. We're down about 1% yeah. on the NASDAQ, down about 6 tenths on the S&P 500. That's going on. Let's go to Washington now and figure out what happens, not in Atlanta after Georgia, but what happens in the white marble of Capitol Hill. Henrietta Trey's joins Economic Policy Director with Veda Partners in serious uh, Capitol Hill cred. How does your world change now? What does a gridlock look like in 2023? Well, helpfully for the Democrats, they are locked and loaded in the Senate. They've got their 51 seats. They can uh, hold committee hearings. They can confirm whoever they need to. Um, it's going to smooth passage and honestly lift the fog of the last couple of weeks that has sort of settled over D.C. as everybody on the Democratic side and the Republican side wait for the outcome of last night's right. election. So that decisive win should clear us up on a lot of really niche issues, um, things like whether the uh, Boeing jets will be certified whether the Durbin Amendment on Visa and MasterCard will be approved, um, whether we can't get a pipeline permitting bill through right. the government funding mm -hmm. package. But There's the, hopefully going to be a lot of movement. So maybe the power changes for Joe Manchin, Cinema of Arizona, in that. On the Republican side, where McCarthy's not even sure he's going to be speaker, are there Joe Manchin-like people or a cadre within the House Republicans that can block what McCarthy and the Republican leadership want to do? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a four vote margin. And I would say that in order to be functional for the big tent that is the Republican Party over on the House side, Kevin McCarthy or whomever the next speaker is really needed 20 or even 25, 30 extra votes um, in the sort of middle of the road camp. Now you have a very fractured Republican conference in the House. I think it'll be really difficult and fascinating to watch the January 3rd election for speaker. And then again, um, as we get into call it July or even September at the latest, the debt ceiling fight. It could very be, well be that whoever the speaker is in the beginning half of the year is not the speaker in the back half of the year, we, uh, based on what they've got coming. We started this conversation talking about the iPhone and the TSMC uh, production outfit they're building over in Phoenix. We haven't talked about who's going to staff up some of the production that we're onshoring or near shoring. How much are you seeing that continue to percolate in discussions in Washington with some real policy of how to bring more people back to the labor force and train them for some very highly specified roles. It's funny you mentioned that. I was just at a lunch with a, a guy that you guys speak with all the time, Torsten Slock at Apollo, and we were talking about exactly that. How are we going to get immigration to tick up so we can get everything from those high-tech jobs down to the farm workers in? Um, and there is a couple of separate bills that are pending right now. I do not have any kind of high odds that they'll be approved before the end of this year. I think the split in the House and Senate is just too severe and to get anything on immigration done, even helpful stuff. So to that end, I sort of look to Mexico. There's been a lot of talk um, from, for instance, instance, the Commerce Secretary, about how you can get a uh, really helpful supply chain build out on you know, <laughs> testing these products or packaging these products from Mexico, which would be near shoring or friend shoring. So I think to look, look for a lot of that, um, a lot of optimism on that front. I don't know that there will be an immigration deal that brings in a whole host of workers that we're obviously going to need for those new production facilities in Arizona and elsewhere. Well, and these are the two issues that I've been looking at. The labor market, everyone's saying it's so tight in the United States, and then we're building out these factories and wondering, okay, well, who's going to come in? 
in and work for them. And the second point has been gasoline prices that have been coming down dramatically. And this has been one of the key mar hallmarks of uh, President Biden's past couple of months in terms of the SPR releases. And we're seeing now crude prices almost down to that threshold where they said they would start buying and rebuilding their inventories. When do they pull the trigger? How much are you hearing conversations about that in D.C.? Um, I think there's a lot of mixed bag on the oil and gas front. Um, one of the areas that I've spent a bunch of time recently is the idea of that windfall profits tax out in California that we're monitoring very closely. I do think that there will be efforts to replenish the SPR, especially after we've, after we've depleted it for the last uh, however many months now. Um, so I do think that there is a lot of um, encouragement for that, and that would be done at the administration level, so hopefully you don't need Congress to weigh in on that. Um, but certainly you see a more proactive House and Senate uh, members writing a lot more letters, uh, trying to advise the president, trying to advise the Fed on what they should do from here on out. And it's really mm -hmm. going to be up to the agencies, up to the executive branch, because Congress is not going to get anything done after, call it, December 23rd, to be generous. Henrietta, are incumbents more entrenched as we move forward? I think incumbents are definitely entrenched. And what we have here is a unique situation where so many of the House Republicans are relative freshmen. They all come in since 2016 when President Trump first won. Last time I checked, I think it was like 75 percent of the House Republican conference is all new since 2016. So technically they're incumbents, but that's a pretty um, kooky set of incumbency environments or experiences that they've had. So I, I would expect for incumbents to sort of stick with what they know, caucus pretty hard, especially on the Democratic side, where Hakeem Jeffries is going to try to, um, you know, figure out how his caucus works. Um, but the Republican conference is so fractured, incumbency means sort of a different thing on that on that level. You're going to get uh, that, that freshman class or that since 2016 class that acts a lot differently than the old guys. Never boring down in Washington, Tom. She's great. She, she says She's the best value in the shortest time. Uh, you know, I think maybe Valier can compete, but it's just I learned so much there. Henry de Shrey's there, a Vader Partners. Do we have a new time person mm -hmm. of the year? We do. This is really important, and I want to go back to 2007 with immense uh, respect for Keith Grossman and the team at Time. Time Magazine 2007 said Vladimir Putin is our person of the year, and this was because he took the country from chaos to, quote, the table of world power, was the quote in 2007. And today it is Mr. Zelensky. And we got some chaos, we got haven't some we? Chaos. Big time, 15 had, years later. To, to review this with Maria, I thought she was lights out today. Forget about the World Cup chit chat. They put a drone attack within, I'm going to say, 90 to 100 miles of Moscow. Can you imagine a drone attack? You know, let's not make jokes about it, but say of Canada on Albany. I mean, that's what we're talking about geographically. What's well, your point, Tom? There's still a war ongoing. We'll be going into a new year. As well. And the length of it, yes. And yeah. there are some people saying that we're still <clears throat> underestimating risk in Europe as it, as it pertains to the energy story. This is the time person of the year. Can I just fit this in? We've, we spent the morning Please. talking about the World Cup and Please. Spain's loss to Morocco. Let's talk about Morocco's win over Spain. The gentleman that scored that last penalty kick, Ashraf Hakimi, mm -hmm. born in Madrid, Moroccan parents, mother was a cleaner, father was a street vendor, came up through the Real Madrid Academy, chose to play for Morocco and scored that final penalty, yeah. to, Tom, to beat Spain. Just absolutely and I, and I, phenomenal story. And, phenomenal. I, I mean, I, I think Lisa's better than me on this. My geography on this, I simply failed yesterday. I had no idea some of the nuances off of Gibraltar between Morocco and with, is it Maleta, the, the little town of Spain that's on the North African coast? I mean, Lisa, it's like back to Barbary Pirates of Thomas Jefferson. Brothers playing each other. It's so close, you know, and it's basically Amazing. what you just highlight and the fact that, yeah. that he chose one over the other, but shows the unity and the closest of these two nations. Congratulations to Morocco. Who do they play? A little bit later, Portugal, later this week. They play Portugal. Yeah. And they've got a new guy. I mean, I love that a 40-year-old almost scored for Portugal. Ronaldo's gone, eh? Yeah. Ah, it's not looking good for him. Yeah. Replaced from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa Bramlitz and Tom King, John Farrell preparing to um, get you through the 9 o'clock hour worldwide on Bloomberg uh, Television. A little bit of weight to the tape here. Futures negative 19. The VIX out from 20 level, even 19 level 
a few days ago. The angst of four or five days, 22 Point eight two is well. We turn to New York Mets fan Bramo right now, and <laughs> I can tell you, folks, this. this is really something. You got a photo out on Twitter, not far down from the fold, put out twelve fifteen hours ago, of the great Aaron Judge in a San, Fr- San Francisco Giants uniform, and Lisa Ken Rosenthal in the great Joe Marisi, John Marisi, saying maybe not. There is out on Twitter. I don't really have a confirmation, but I'm going to go with it. Mr. Judge will stay in New York and not with Stevie Cohen. Not with Stevie Cohen. I think that that's why you're wind up about me being a Mets fan. $360 million deal for nine years with the Yankees, that being reported by The Athletic. $40 million a year. Not too shabby. I'm going to make it, you know, just to move on here to our important guest. But, folks, with Paul Sweeney, we'll cover this in the 9 o'clock hour on Bloomberg Radio with Sweeney's media expertise. And I'm sorry, Lisa, it's just simple. Sports wins. There's all this death and doom and gloom about it. And when we're chatting up World Cup and, you know, all the rest of it, the fact is you see it in the signing season of baseball, big money it's being thrown around. You know, you say that there's such emotion in, in football <clears throat> and in, in soccer. There's also a lot of emotion in baseball. There's a lot mm-hmm. of feeling with this, and you could feel that in Anne Marie's tweet. Yeah, I, yeah. I just got an email in. You know, I look at folks, the desk transfers within Bloomberg. I'm on that feed, and I notice that Michael Barr has put in a desk transfer to get as far away from <laughs> Bramo as he can with Verlander now going to the dreaded. New York Mets. We get back on topic now with futures negative 15. Uh, the VIX again, 22.73. Blarina Arici joins us now, U.S. economist at T. Rowe Price. Blarina, thank you, thank you so much for being with us. My head is spinning over what the actual view of the American economy is, not the guesstimate out six months. Where are we right now? What's your working figure for some form of inflation-adjusted GDP Q4? That's a great question. Uh, Everybody's confused because we're getting such mixed messages from the data. Is the labor market accelerating, even though the Fed has been hiking at such a fast pace? What's going on with growth and consumer spending? I would say in Q4 of this year, the U.S. economy is shaping up to expand at a healthy pace, probably 2 to 3 percent after being adjusted from inflation. And once again, what's pulling through the U.S. economy is the consumer, consumer spending data, both on services and goods for the beginning of Q4. We're pretty solid uh, for services as well as goods. So, yeah, we're in a good spot right now, but I think more deceleration is to come next year, unfortunately. The, The outlooks of the sell side are extraordinary this year. I've truly never seen the chaos, the cacophony is out there. What are you advising portfolio managers at T. Rowe Price? You guys invented on the buy side a fractious debate. This is, folks, I'm going to say 40, if not 50 years ago. Are they listening to you? And if they are, what's the line for them of how to be invested given this chaos? So how do we navigate these cross currents uh, that we're facing in 2023? I would say that the main thing is we expect interest rates to continue increasing. That means there's going to be yields in those fixed fixed income portfolios that we uh, manage. However, as we look at the question of whether do we add risk or do we not add risk next year, the outlook for employment growth and consumption growth slowing in 2023 means that we're tentatively more conservative when we're positioning ourselves with respect to risk. We were talking with Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, a bit ago, and he was saying there still is this feeling of uh, transitory baked into people's expectations. It's just been pushed out that basically there will be an immaculate disinflationary force that will come into play at the end of next year and allow the downturn to not be as severe as some people feared. Do you adhere to that kind of idea? Well, I think lots of questions for the second half of next year. First of all, I do think the Fed will get some help from the transitory question when it comes to uh, inflation. And we're going to start seeing that concretely in core goods inflation in the first half of next year. So I think that will be a factor helping the outlook for next year. However, when it comes to the question of a recession, I do notice as well that uh, lots of commentators are saying just because we don't see the imbalances right now that this is, if we do have a recession, it's going to be a shallow one. I don't think I necessarily agree with that. Uh, I think once uh, recessionary processes take place and, and start to get into motion, 
things break in the economy that we don't necessarily anticipate. This is what happens in every recession. The other factor that I think weighs against the U.S. economy next year is that monetary policy has been tightening at a very, very fast pace compared to the last 20, 30 years. And the other one is that it's facing a very adverse global environment with growth in China slowing, uh, growth in Europe slowing, uh, contraction expected actually in Europe for the first half of this year. So the external environment is not that favorable. And then domestically, we have very tight monetary policy as well. Given the headwinds, why do you think the Fed is still going to get to 5%? Well, I think the headwinds are more uh, based for the second half of the year. And I think the Fed is so focused on realized inflation mm-hmm. and the trend of three months uh, moving annualized average of core inflation that I think it will uh, need to continue hiking right. and delivering on those hikes that have been already priced in the market. Well, you know, Sebastian Page emails in. I'm kidding. But for Sebastian Page, who's expert <laughs> on diversification, his wonderful book out on allocation in realities, folks, a colleague of Blarina's at T. Rowe Price. Blarina, one of the great things Lisa and I see is OECD views, grim. IMF views, grim. Is now fi- This is a loaded question. Is now the time to buy international and EM equities? That's simple. So this is the most anticipated recession in history. Is that what you're saying? So has all the bad news been priced in and is it time to dip into those more risky assets? I think we're still on the fence about that because of the question that we just discussed, that once we get into a recession, things can break unexpectedly. So I think we're still being a little bit more cautious in our portfolio allocations. And Sebastian will be able to tell you more. I think this is a very fair answer. You know, we make jokes about people on the fence, but I think there's a huge body of people right now on the fence about go long EM, go long international, burnt once, burnt twice, burnt three times, four times, on and on and on. There's a lot of people on the fence. Especially when we hear about the Dutch GDP that Damien Sassar was yes, talking about, well near said. record highs, yeah. which is going to be a pervasive concern for a longer period of time. Blarina, when you look at what's going to happen next year, how much confidence do you have that the, uh, that the inflation is going to come down enough to support this expectation that we see over at HSBC, for example, that the 10 year is going to get down to two and a half percent because of that long term reversion back to what we used to know. I think there are some uh, tailwinds for inflation next year. So Chair Powell very helpfully split this into three pillars in his speech at Brookings last week. I think the first pillar of coal or goods is coming down significantly next year. We still have the effect of the dollar appreciation feeding into core goods with a lag. I think we have those rising inventory levels and slowing consumer demand on or consumer spending on goods and the improvement in supply chains, as well as transportation costs. I also look at private sector rental prices. They do feed into the uh, rent components of CPI with a lag. And I think they're telling me that around the second quarter of next year, we'll get significant progress there as well. But I think on average, even if inflation remains sticky in the other services components, on average is going to be trending down in a sustained basis. But we shouldn't extrapolate this into the Fed is going to uh, cut rates significantly immediately as we hit a a rough patch in the U.S. economy. Just real quick before we let you go, where have all the missing workers gone? This is something that Jay Powell has been talking about. Great, great question. We, this is a great question, and we did a deep dive across our fixed income division here to look into some of the factors that are keeping labor supply so depressed. The ones that really stood out to us is the interaction, first of all, of demographics and COVID. We knew that we had a demographic headwind to uh, labor supply, and then COVID made people retire even sooner than they would have otherwise. We also have a big, big hole in our labor supply from the lack of uh, migrant workers. Uh, Immigration visa processing (laughs) collapsed in 2020 and 2021. We estimate about one and a half to two million workers are missing from this. And then we have other more structural long-term factors that are keeping uh, depressed Mm -hmm. the prime Uh, age workers, uh, especially male workers. So lots of demographic, lots of structural factors uh, keeping labor supply low. Can monetary policy do anything about this? We don't think so. 
So they just have to bring down demand right. for labor. Uh, very good. Belina, uh, thank you so much. Belarina Arucci with us with T. Rowe Price as well. I want to go back to, without question, the midweek note from Ian Lingen of BMO Capital Markets. Folks, he writes always one of the most densest, read it every word, every word note on Wall Street. And it's usually, I'm going to say, two Bloomberg screens. This time around, it's four, five, six screens. And Lisa, I, I literally have to go back and read the note, I'm going to say, three times to get some of the dynamics. What's the dynamic to you that Lingen and Jeffries write about today at BMO Capital Markets. A sizable chance of five and a quarter or five and a half percent Fed funds rate, terminal Fed funds rate this cycle. It is much higher than what the market is currently pricing in. It is that that is not insignificant, and that means that curve inversion is going to be even steeper, which goes back to we've been talking about, yes, this is the, the yield curve is inverted the most going back to 1981. <clears throat> is it perhaps questionable why it's not even steeper. And, and, and on radio, I got my hands out here. Do you suggest then that it's the two-year dynamic, as Mr. Lingen suggests, that will move the inversion either way versus the 10-year one? You know, this is the mystery. That's what he's saying. I think other people would disagree and say yes, the dynamic yeah. comes in the other end. HSBC in particular coming out with a forecast of 2.5% 10-year yields by the end of next year. The real question here, will the Fed have the conviction <clears throat> to go as far as they need to go to curtail longer-term inflation expectations. Right. And you'll see that out in the long end. Trenchant analysis at Bloomberg Surveillance of our sports coverage. And we go to our sports colleague, Anne-Marie with no E, who's out with an important tweet here. I mean, it's real simple, folks. Gracing us with her New York Yankees jacket as the Yankees failed to move forward this fall. Mr. Rosenthal. Of the bow tie. We only show Ken Rosenthal because of his classic bow tie. New York Yankees are nowhere for judge. Okay, can Stevie, I just say? Stevie, Lisa, look at that. The sadness of Maria, the glee of Anne Maria Hardern, such emotion from our team here. Just really. The constant theme, yeah. the theatrics, the cinema of Bloomberg surveillance. Rumor has it. We'll do this tomorrow. We'll have to see on that. Futures Negative 12, stay with us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock has turned back at Republican Herschel Walker in Georgia's runoff election. Warnock was reelected with a little more than 51% of the vote. His victory will give Democrats a 51 to 49 edge in the Senate, making it easier to legislate. Walker had been backed by former President Trump. China is retreating from the wide-ranging COVID zero policy that it blamed for the damaging for the damaging of the economy. Beijing will now allow some people to quarantine at home instead of in centralized camps. It's also scrapping virus tests to enter public venues. COVID zero pushed down consumer and business confidence and left people stuck in a cycle of outbreaks and lockdowns. Mortgage rates in the U.S. have fallen for the fourth week in a row. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the rate on a fixed 30-year loan fell slightly to just a little more than 6.4 percent. Rates have fallen as the Federal Reserve has signaled it will soon slow down the pace of interest rate hikes. Uber is launching its first robo-taxi service. The ride-hailing company will offer customers self-driving trips in Las Vegas. Uber is partnering with Motional, a joint venture between Hyundai and Aptiv. The test run comes at a time when the hype around self-driving vehicles is fading. And shares of GSK and Sanofi are surging today. A U.S. judge rejected scientific evidence behind claims that the heartburn drug Zantac can cause cancer. That means the drug makers don't have to face more than 5,000 lawsuits. A group of plaintiffs, lawyers, say they'll appeal. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. war is 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 um, I think there's some headwinds given we're changing economic conditions but the competition for talent is still very very strong now how that evolves in 2023 is unknown 
Certainly, if we have a slower economic environment, it will have an effect. There's still talent. Is We seek talent all the time. We bring them in the company. We're just more careful about it in times like this because, frankly, we have great talent. We want to make sure we can pay them and, and promote them and give them opportunity. Managing the message. Mr. Solomon, Mr. Moynihan, Mr. Diamond on the Death Star as well yesterday. Everybody talking up the view forward here on economics and maybe a little bit of bank talk as well. For Global Wall Street, we welcome all of you on radio and television. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keene. Mr. Farrow prepares to move forward at 9 o'clock. Straight talk now on what you care about, which is the future of Credit Suisse. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the body count here uh, after the pandemic boom in financial services. Allison Williams, definitive on this with Bloomberg Intelligence. Back to Payne Weber, back to the certitude. Remember, Allison, we believe. And what, whether it was Smith Barney or E.F. Hutton or Payne Weber and all that, you were too young to remember that, but I certainly I remember it. What I want to talk about is I got a boutique firm being built, I believe, in New York called Credit Suisse, whatever, first, bo uh, first boss, and I don't know what to call it as well. What is Credit Suisse going to plant in New York in the coming quarters? I think that is the question. They they came out with the strategy. Everyone wanted it. There weren't <clears throat> enough details. That shouldn't be surprising, right? Because Fair. they had to come out and study the stock. The most important thing for Credit Suisse is they came out, they raised the capital. We still don't know how that looks in terms of capital adequacy because they announced uh, one and a half billion uh, pre-tax franc loss for the fourth quarter. So obviously that takes back some of the, the money that they've raised. Um, but the real questions ahead are, you know, what happens with Credit Suisse First Boston? Can they successfully spin this out? <clears throat> it's sort of interesting and a nod to some of right. the boutiques that we've seen, um, you know, over the last 10 <clears throat> or 15 years started by a lot of the <clears throat> store bankers. Uh, it's interesting because they can sort of tie comp to the business and away from trading and a lot of the other troubles. But then we have a, you know, there's a lot of other moving parts. Right. And. It remains to be seen if they can get this done. Restructuring is never in a straight line, and it's never good to be mm. in a poor revenue environment. Uh, it's amazing. It's a group email. David, Brian, and Jamie email in all together and say, ask Allison about the boutiques. This word boutiques is smaller, more nimble. Good morning, Roger Altman and the rest that invented this. But the boutique firms, do they have the high ground going into next year because of big bank struggle? Well, they're preparing for it, right? So they're picking up talent. I would say that even though, you know, tis the season that uh, for a lot of good things, but a lot of bad things in terms of we'll be hearing about job cuts, we'll be seeing headlines going to the year. But when you look at the numbers, they're they're very small in the context of the growth that we've had. And I would point to Solomon's comments um, in the interview yesterday where he said, you know, competition is surprisingly strong. That's because of the boutiques. But I would also point to uh, Daniel Pinto comments, the head of J.P. Morgan's investment bank, a couple months ago. And he said, look, you know, we're going to cut comp and not bankers because we don't want to be in the position we were in 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 the summer of 2021 when they were scrambling to add people. We saw the, the headlines then about the junior bankers getting those people in place. I, the pipelines are still good and healthy. That was something we've heard consistently. We've heard it all year. We need those pipelines to execute. And I do think that bankers are going to hold hold out hope that if we can get uh, some momentum or some strength in the seasonally strong first quarter, maybe some deals can get all right, done. Let's go there and really uh, highlight how confusing the message from all of the bank CEOs yesterday was. On one hand, they were talking about a potential downturn. On the other hand, they were talking about resilience. They were talking about, yes, consumer spending declining, but not that much. Competition very strong, still need for the people, even though Morgan Stanley did cut something like 1,600 jobs or is planning to not even getting close to where we were pre-pandemic in terms of how much they've expanded. What was your big takeaway? Are things bad or are things not really that bad, but they want to sort of justify any moves that they make going forward? I think things are slowing, but I think what they're, they're trying to put the context of how well positioned they are to handle it. So this is sort of the opposite of where we were going into the great financial crisis, right? So banks were highly levered, not prepared um, for the significant downturn. And then the pandemic again. So the, the last two cycles we had were crises. And we're going to have a credit cycle, but it, we think it's probably something more like 
the 2000 credit cycle, so a normal credit cycle. And the, the capital levels are so much stronger uh, today than, than where we were entering then. I'll just give one more statistic, which is I, I thought was a great one that uh, Jamie threw out at uh, the, the last conference call. Six percent unemployment. Six billion they have to add to reserves. That compares to you know fifteen billion over a couple of quarter couple of quarters in the pandemic. This is kind of controversial. Are we seeing revenge of the big banks in terms of the shadow banking system that grew up around them and really stole a lot of the lending business over the past couple of years? Suddenly stuck trying to figure out how to evaluate some of the private assets that are being called into question increasingly by some investors, whereas the big investment banks have pretty pruned back balance sheets and are able to kind of ride through this. They are because it has been, you know, you could you could look at the 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 crisscrossing lines, the share of credit has left the banks and gone to the funds. You know, private credit, you know, private equity used to be the thing, private credit has really been um, the area of interest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going to your point about slowdown, I think that's where we've heard some of the more worrisome um, talk just in terms of these huge firms and talking about they think things are going to be, you know, things have slowed and they see that slowing through the first half. Gina Martin Adams, you have this new MVP index out and it's value stocks and you rebalance it every 90 days. Where do banks play a part in that? Are they a value when you do a factor analysis? Do the banks relatively look good right now? Banks are, are generally value stocks. Um, you know, in terms of the valuation, you know, we don't necessarily do that at Bloomberg. We can right. talk low and high. Um, there's by some metrics, they're not, you know, screamingly at the low end. I think, you know, we 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 have seen some rebound off the lows, obviously. But what um, Gina says, which is interesting, is that we are still looking for an environment that <clears throat> could favor value next year. And so, after several years of growth, I, well outperformance, uh, value had has had a good year, and. She's looking for fair value right. next year, pr pretty flattish returns, value outperforming. Mm -hmm. That's pretty similar to what we've seen um, recently. If Credit Suisse was an American bank, could they exist today? Are they getting a special pass by the Swiss government, Swiss regulators? They're not getting a special pass. I think the capital raise was really necessary in order to bring them in compliance. But the interesting thing about the Swiss banks is those two banks, the two banks specifically, UBS and Credit Suisse, if you look at their balance sheets, uh, m maybe not today, but in general, those balance sheets compared to the economy, the Swiss economy, is so important that their capital ratios are much higher mm -hmm. compared to a lot of the global peers. They're, they're much higher regulated. And a lot of the fears around Credit Suisse, keep in mind, are meeting those higher requirements. Allison, thank you so much. I got like 14 more questions. Don't be a stranger here. Allison Williams uh, with us with banking, Bloomberg Intelligence. What'd you get out of that, Lisa? My head's spinning. <laughs> now I get no idea what to do there. Just this idea that perhaps next year the banks will be in a position to pick up uh, some of the advantage that we're seeing with respect to trading. And we've seen that in some of their balance sheets yeah. so that we have seen a resilience there. The question mark has really been outside of the banks. And that's the reason why we had such a nuanced kind of message. On one hand, yes, we potentially could get a recession. On the other hand, they were trying to sort of portray this image yeah. of resilience and strength. Let's do some market research here. When was the last time I was in a post office? When was the last time I was in a bank? branch like forever what are we waiting for i mean i know there's a roll up of branches and all that but i just wonder with the tensions that are out there right now if the whole thing gets sped up the whole digital thing gets hyper hyper sped up i don't know well, that's one thing that I think a lot of people have been looking at is the investment in digital and how that pairs right. with the uh, appeal right. to the consumer like Marcus, for example, which I know you have very strong feelings about and what know, Goldman Sachs is going to do with, with that effort. Yeah, it didn't get, we didn't get to that with Allison. It, it, can we just state that Anne-Marie Horton is out of control this morning? I mean, the number of emails we're getting in and on the judge stop. signing. <laughs> <laughs> the, she's just she's out of lost control. It. So we're giving Maria a podium to talk about her heart, I mean, heartbreaking they, uh, experience with Spain, and we're going to call Anne Marie I mean, out of control. If there was, oh, a, it's okay. if there was a press game, conference clearly. today in the East Room of the White House, she stand up, Mr. President. What please, can Aaron you Judge? comment on that Aaron Judge made the right decision? That's what she's. It would be that lame. I mean, you know, it's embarrassing.
and where you are not embarrassing, you are it's, never embarrassing. Embarrassed. Thank you for what you do right now. Can we get somebody <laughs> that covers Washington that actually knows who the Boston Red Sox are? Is that really? asking too much? Really? Gonna Joe Matthew her? in Atlanta. We got to hear more from Joe. Less to Man Marie. It's all there is to it. Features at negative nine. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.